To the Hilt by Dick Francis Read by Martin Jarvis My mother sent me a postcard. Perhaps I'd better tell you your stepfather has had a heart attack, which I read outside the remote Scottish post office where I went every two weeks to collect my letters. I went back in and begged Donald for the use of the telephone. Mother, I said, eventually connected to her in London, this is Al. Alexander, she corrected automatically. Are you in Scotland? I am. My father had been killed in a shooting accident out on the moors twelve years before, and a year later my mother had married Ivan George Westering, widower, baronet, brewer, pillar of the British Jockey Club, my stepfather. How ill is he? I asked. Do you want me to come down? You can come if you like, my mother said. It's entirely up to you. Despite the casual voice, it sounded closer to a plea than I was used to. I'll arrive tomorrow. If you're sure, I'm sure. Very well. I paid for the phone call and returned to my ancient four-wheel drive outside. It contained food for two weeks, a big cylinder of butane gas, and three brown cardboard boxes, parcel delivery, replenishing the tools of my trade. I painted pictures of infinite variety, but most of my not inconsiderable income came from golfing scenes. Americans couldn't have too many of them, bless them. I lived in a broken-down shepherd's hut known as a bothy, out on a windy Scottish mountainside. I was the 29-year-old son of the fourth son of an earl. I paid my uncle, the present earl, known as himself, a painting a year as rent for the ruin I inhabited on his estate. The painting was done to his choice. He mostly asked for portraits of his horses or dogs. I drove my wheels northwards, at first along a recognisable road, then a roughly gravelled stretch, then up a long rutted track which led nowhere but to my unnamed home in the Mona Lea Mountains. My bothy backed straight into a granite outcrop that sheltered it from the north and east. In front lay a small stony plateau that dropped away steeply, giving me long views of valleys and rocky hills, and of a main road far below. The only problem with the road was that my dwelling was visible from it, so that far too often I found hikers on my doorstep, equipped with shorts, maps, and walking boots. On the day of my mother's postcard, I returned to find four of the species poking around. Male, blue, scarlet, orange backpacks, glasses, English regional accents. I drove onto the plateau, stopped the engine, eased from the ignition, and walked towards my front door. The four men ranged themselves into a line across my path. I felt the first tremble of something wrong. I stopped walking and said, what do you want? Where is it? One of them demanded. I said, I don't know what you mean. Whereupon I had a sort of splintered, composite view of intent, malevolent faces, of grey daylight reflecting on their incongruous glasses, of their hard, bombarding fists, and of a wildly slanting horizon as I doubled forward over a debilitating pain in the abdomen. Neck chop, jabs to the ribs, over and over, thud merciless thud. One of the men kept saying, Where is it? Where is it? I wondered vaguely if, by it, they meant money, of which I carried little. They were welcome to it, I thought, groggily, if they would stop their attentions. Somehow or other I ended with my back against the jeep. One of them banged my head against metal. Events became unclear. I slid to the ground, face down. Where is it? I didn't answer. I felt hands roughly searching my pockets. Didn't move. Drifted. He's out, a voice said. After a time of floating, I felt their hands on me again. Is he alive? He's breathing. Chuck him over there. Over there turned out to be the edge of the plateau but I didn't realize it until I'd been dragged across the stones and lifted and flung. I went down the steep mountain slope, bouncing from rock to rock, 
unable to stop. I slammed down onto a larger rock and did stop there, half on my side, half on my stomach. I felt pulverized. Thought vanished. Some sort of consciousness soon came crazily back, but orderly memory took much longer. Those bastard hikers, I thought, eventually. I remembered their faces, like demons in a dream. I tried to move. A mistake. Those bastards had been real. Their fists had been real. Where is it had been real. In spite of everything, I smiled ruefully. What time was it? I looked at my left wrist, but my watch had gone. Hell's teeth, I thought abruptly. Mother, Ivan, heart attack. I was supposed to be going to London. With a groan, I raised myself from prone to kneeling on my rock and took a look up at where I'd come down. The edge of the plateau was far above. Looking down was almost worse. I understood at once where I was. If I could traverse to the right without losing my footing, I would come to the path from the road below up to my home. I would never normally have attempted what now confronted me without an axe and crampons, let alone with every move a wince. But fear kept me stuck like glue to every protruding scrap of solid rock. The path, when at last I reached it, was by comparison a broad highway. With reluctant muscles and a fearful mind, I began the climb. I crawled the last bit on hands and knees and raised my head for a cautious look without anyone pouncing and kicking me back into space. The reason for the absence of attackers was obvious. My jeep had gone. I stood up. Not only had I lost my transport, but the door of my home stood wide open with my belongings spilling out of it, a chair, clothes, books, bedclothes. I walked wearily across and looked in. When I had moved into the tumble-down building five and a half years earlier, I had made only the centre and largest of its three divisions habitable. Apart from a bed, a small table, a chest of drawers and one comfortable chair, the whole room was taken up by three easels, stacked canvases, a work stool, a wall of shelves and the equivalent of a kitchen table covered with pots and tubes of paints and other essentials of my work like jugs of brushes and painting knives and jam jars full of clear or dirty water. I had left work in progress on all three easels. All three were now face down on the floor, thoroughly saturated by the kicked over buckets. My work table lay on its side, pots, brushes and paints spilling wide. Burst paint tubes had been squashed underfoot. My bed had been tipped over, chest of drawers ransacked, box files pulled down from the shelves, ditto books, every container emptied, sugar and coffee granules scattered in a filthy jumbled chaos. The clothes I was wearing were torn and dirty, and I'd been bleeding from many scrapes and scratches. The bothy had been robbed, as far as I could see, of everything I could have raised money on. My wallet and my watch had gone. My checkbook had been in the jeep. I had said I would go to London. Well, so I bloody well would. I sorted out only the cleanest jeans, jersey and shirt from the things emptied out of the chest of drawers, and I changed into them out by the burn, rinsing off the dried trickles of blood in the cold, clean water. Of the two ruined flanks to my habitable room, one was now a carport with a grey camouflage-painted roof of corrugated iron. The other, still open to the skies, was where I kept the gas cylinders and also rubbish bins. Nothing in these two side sections had been vandalised. From the jumble on the main bothy floor, I harvested a broken stick of charcoal and slid pieces of it into my shirt pocket. I found a sketch pad with some clean pages, and armed with such few essentials, I left home and set off down the path to the road. By the time I reached it, there was a hint of dusk in the sky. It was the time of day when I stopped painting. As it was then September, watch or no watch, I could pretty accurately guess at 6.30. There was enough traffic on the road for me to hitch a ride into Dalwhinnie. Lights were going on everywhere when I reached the station, and I made a reverse charge telephone call. A familiar Scots voice 
at the far end. Yes, of course I'll pay for the call. Is that you, Al? What the heck are you doing at Dalwhinnie? Catching the night train to London, the Royal Highlander. Oh, it doesn't go for hours. No. What are you doing at this moment? Al? What's the matter? I'd be very glad of your help. I'm on my way. Jed Parlane was my uncle's factor, the man who managed the Kinloch Scottish estates. He came striding into Dalwini Station after his twelve or more mile drive to reach me and stood four square in front of where I sat on a bench. I stood out stiffly. Does the heater work in your car? I followed him outside to where he'd parked. I sat in his front passenger seat while he restarted the engine and twiddled knobs to bring out hot air. OK, he said, switching on the car's internal light. So, what's happened to your face? You're going to have a hell of a black eye. That left-hand side of your forehead and temple's all swollen. I told him about the four pseudo-hillwalkers and the devastation in the bothy. The door isn't locked, I said. They took my keys, so tomorrow maybe you'll take your own key along there. I'll take the police, he said. He pulled a notebook and pen from inside his jacket and asked for a list of things missing. My jeep, everything in it, food and stores and so on. And from the bothy they took my binoculars and camera and all my winter padded clothes and four finished paintings and climbing gear and some Glenlivet. Oh, and my golf clubs. I paused. They took all my cash and my credit card. I don't know its number, though it's somewhere on file in your office. Will you alert them? And my father's gold watch. Anyway, I finished. If you have a credit card with you, a ticket to London. Why London? Ivan Westering has had a heart attack. Oh, the police will want you to give a statement. The bothy is a statement. I fished a piece of charcoal stick out of my shirt pocket and opened the sketch pad I still carried. I'll draw my attackers. It'll be better than just describing them. Were well, they looking for anything special? I glanced across at him with half a smile. One of them kept saying, Where is it? Did you tell them? Of course not. I drew the four men in a row, face on. Knees, boots, glasses, air of threat. Anyway, I said, they didn't say what they were looking for. They just said, Where is it? So it might have been anything. He nodded. I finished the composite sketch and turned to a clean page. I drew the head of the where is it man, as I remembered him the most clearly. I drew him without glasses. This is their leader, I explained. I'm not good at voices and accents, but I'd say his was Southeast England. Same with them all. Hard men? Well, they'd all done time in a boxing gym, I'd say. Short arm jabs, like at a punch bag. I swallowed. Out of my league. I drew the other three faces, each on a separate page, and gave him the sketch pad. Vivian Westering, my mamma, looked me up and down before dispensing a hug on her doorstep. Really, Alexander, she said, haven't you any clothes free of paint? Few. You look thin. You look... well, you'd better come in. I followed her into the polished hallway of the architectural gem she and Ivan inhabited in the semicircle of Park Crescent by Regent's Park and down to the basement kitchen. How's Ivan? He's so depressed. He lies in bed most of the time. He won't get dressed. He hardly eats. Is his heart in a bad state? They said there wasn't any need for bypasses or a pacemaker. He spent a few days in the clinic. They used one of those balloon things on one of his arteries, that's all. And he has to take pills, of course. Shall I go up and say hello? His nurse is with him now. Uh, Wilfred, he sleeps on the top floor. You shouldn't have to deal with all this by yourself, I said. Well, Patsy came. Patsy was Ivan's daughter by his first marriage. Her chief concern was to prevent Ivan leaving his fortune and his brewery to my mother and not to herself. Patsy's feelings for me, as my mother's potential heir, would have curdled sulfuric acid. I imagine she did more harm than good. She nodded. Ivan's got enough on his plate without Patsy's insecurity. 
there's some sort of serious trouble at the brewery, and also I think he's worried about the cup. What cup? The King Alfred Cup. What else? I frowned. Do you mean the race? The King Alfred Gold Cup, sponsored by Ivan's Brewery as a great advertisement for King Alfred Gold Beer, was a splendid two-mile steeplechase run every October, a regular part now of the racing year. The race or the cup itself, my mother said. I'm not sure. The kitchen was abruptly invaded by two large middle-aged ladies. Morning, Lady Westering, they said. A double act. Sisters, perhaps. My mother said... Edna and Lois. Edna cooks, Lois cleans. I smiled politely. Edna and Lois eyed me disapprovingly. I said to my mother, Wilfred, notwithstanding, I'll go up now and see Ivan. I found my mother following me up the stairs. Don't tell me, I teased her once we were out of the kitchen. Patsy employed those two. She didn't deny it. How long have they worked here? A week, my mother replied. Sir Ivan Westering, my stepfather, was sitting palely in his study, which adjoined his bedroom. He wore a crimson woolen dressing gown and brown leather slippers. How are you feeling? I asked, sitting in a chair opposite him. He looked older, greyer, and a good deal thinner than he'd been on my last visit in the spring. He didn't answer. He simply said, Have you seen your Uncle Robert during the last few days? No. My Uncle Robert was the Earl of Kinloch, himself. I thought he might have wanted to see you. I've asked him... He broke off, then continued, Well, he'll tell you himself. Himself and Ivan had known each other for upwards of twenty years, drawn together by a fondness for owning racehorses. They had their steeplechasers trained in the same yard in Lambourne. I said to Ivan, Mother thinks you may be worried about the cup. Before he could respond, a fifty to sixty, thin, moustached, busy, busy person hurried into the room. Morning, Ivan. How's things? Oh, good of you to come, Keith. I stood up and was identified as my stepson. Dr. Keith Robiston gave me a sharp glance and a sharper question. What analgesic have you been taking for that eye? Uh, aspirin. Are you allergic to any drugs? I don't think so. Are you taking any other drugs? No. Then try these. He produced a small packet from an inner pocket. Dr. Robiston checked on his original patient. Well done, Ivan, he said cheerfully. The ticker's banging away like a baby's. Now don't strain yourself, though, but walk around the house a bit. Where's your dear wife? I answered for him. In her sitting room, I said. He gave me a brief smile on his quick way out. I sat down again opposite Ivan and swallowed one of the tablets. Then Ivan said, Where would you hide something? I blinked. Um, well, it would depend what it was. Something of value. I said, Are we talking about your will? Your Uncle Robert says you know how to hide things. Ivan, I said, Put whatever it is in a bank vault. Uh, I suppose it's a horse, he said. You can't put a horse in a bank vault. You want me to hide a horse? I thought, what the hell am I saying? Would you? The telephone on the table by his elbow rang. He made no attempt to pick up the receiver. He simply waited until it stopped ringing. My mother appeared in the doorway. It's Tobias Tollright, dear. He says it's essential he talks to you. I've told them not to bother me. Please, Ivan. Uh, let Alexander talk to him. I walked over and picked up the phone and explained who I was. But I must speak to Sir Ivan himself, said an agitated voice. Well, if you'll tell me what's the matter, I'll relay it to him for an answer. Well, I'm Tobias Tollright, a partner in a firm of chartered accountants. Uh, we audit the King Alfred Brewery accounts. Right. There are discrepancies. Uh, Sir Ivan is chairman and managing director and major shareholder. The matter is urgent. It's illegal for a limited company to go on trading when it's insolvent. And I fear uh, measures must be taken at once, and only he can authorise them. Well, uh, Mr. Tolwright, um, hold on while I explain. What is it? My mother asked anxiously. 
Ivan didn't ask, but looked deeply exhausted. He knew. I said to him, There are things that only you can deal with. Ivan shook his head. I went back to Tolride. Can your urgent measures save the day? Or perhaps. What if he gives me power of attorney to act for him in this matter? Would that do the trick? How soon could he expect to see me, he asked. Tomorrow? This afternoon. Come to our main offices in Reading. He told me the address. Uh, just hold on, would you? I spoke to my stepfather. I can sign things if you give me the authority. Is that what you really want? I mean, you'll have to trust me a lot. I do trust you. I said into the... Mr. Tolwright, I'll see you as soon as I can. Good. I put down the receiver. Ivan smiled faintly. Your uncle Robert said I could trust you with my life. Ivan, I said, a power of attorney should be signed and witnessed in front of a lawyer. Uh, phone Oliver Grantchester. I'll talk to him. Oliver Grantchester, it seemed, agreed to instant action, but Ivan's gloom nevertheless intensified. How on earth, I wondered, had a brewery as well known as King Alfred's tied itself in financial knots? Standing close outside Wantage, the ancient town of the great king's birth, King Alfred's brewery supplied most of southern England and half of the Midlands. A thin man in a short white cotton jacket came in from the bedroom and told Ivan respectfully that everything was clean and tidy for the day. Wilfred, I presumed. Ivan stood up, swaying unsteadily and knocking a box of tissues from the table to the floor. I picked it up, noticing that it had numbers written on its underside, one a series that I recognised as himself's phone number in Scotland. I offered him my arm. I think I'll just rest until Oliver comes, he said, and I went with him through to his wide bed, where he lay down on the covers and closed his eyes. I went back into his study and eased down into a chair. Dr. Robiston's tablet had at least diminished the acute stabs of muscular pain to an overall ache. Half an hour's comparative peace came to an end with the arrival of Oliver Grantchester, who brought with him a frail-looking young woman, hung around with computer, printer, and a bag of office necessities. Oliver Grantchester and I had met about twice over the years, often enough for both of us. Oh, well, I thought you were in Scotland, he said. Ivan and my mother, hearing his voice, came through from the bedroom and gave him the friendly welcome he hadn't got from me. The lawyer's large, grey-suited body and authoritative voice somehow made the study seem smaller. Perhaps fifty, he had a bald crown surrounded by greying dark hair and a large, fleshy mouth with chins to match. He introduced his assistant as Miranda. My mother settled her at Ivan's desk. Grantchester said to Ivan, You want to draw up a power of attorney? Very wise of you, if I may say so, in view of your health. I brought with me a basic document. You have that ready, Miranda? Miranda nodded. Grantchester went on, Draw up the document naming Mrs. Patsy Benchmark, Sir Ivan's daughter. Not Mrs. Benchmark, said Ivan. I'm giving the power of attorney to Alexander. Oliver Grantchester's mouth opened wide but no sound came out. Alexander Robert Kinloch, Ivan repeated to Miranda. The lawyer, finally finding his voice, said, You can't. Why not? But he's, uh, well, he's, look at him. He has long hair, Ivan agreed. I wish he would cut it. All the same. Ivan wouldn't be budged. Miranda typed my name on the document, and Grantchester told me to sign it, which I did. So did Ivan. Make certified copies, Ivan said. Make ten. The lawyer waved at Miranda, who printed out ten sheets, which Grantchester himself signed, thereby, I gathered, certifying that the power of attorney had been properly drawn. Also, Ivan said, I will write a letter to the brewery's company secretary, making Alexander my alternate director, uh, which will give him authority to act on my behalf in all business decisions at the brewery. You can't. He knows nothing at all about business. Alexander will be my alternate director, Ivan said, obstinately.
My mother gave me her bank card and told me her secret number, a very extreme manifestation of trust. I bought a train ticket to Reading and arrived at the offices of Pierce, Tolwright and Simmons. Tobias Tolwright looked me up and down, inspected the power of attorney and Ivan's letter, and telephoned my mother. Uh, this uh, person says he's your son. Uh, would you please describe him? He had his office phone switched to conference so I could hear her reply. He's about six feet tall, thin. He has chestnut hair, wavy, curling onto his shoulders. And, um, oh yes, he has a black eye. Tobias thanked her and disconnected. Once he'd come to terms with the way I looked, he proved both astute and helpful. In my turn, I ignored his fussy little mannerism of digging round his teeth with a succession of wooden picks. What's wrong? I asked at the brewery. Well, basically, he said, Norman Corn, the man in charge of the brewery's finances, has milked the cow and done a bunk. The brewery cannot, in consequence, meet its obligations. The credit is arrestive, and as auditor, I cannot at the moment give King Alfred an OK to continue trading. So, what are your life belt measures? He hesitated, picking away at the teeth. You might call in an insolvency practitioner. Uh, who? Insolvency practitioner. Someone to negotiate for you. Uh, what will he do? She. Well, what will she do? If she thinks the brewery can be saved, she'll set up a CVA. He looked at my face. A CVA is a creditor's voluntary arrangement. In other words, she'll call together a committee of creditors. She'll explain to them the scope of the losses, and if she can persuade them that the brewery can go back to trading at a profit, they will together work out a rate at which the debts can be paid off, bit by bit. I understand. Now, if the committee acting with the brewery can produce a budget and a forecast that will satisfy me as auditor that the brewery has a viable future, then I can sign the audited accounts and it can continue to trade. What are the chances? Oh, it depends on the creditors. And, um, who are they? Oh, the usual, the bank, the inland revenue, the pension fund, the suppliers. It sounds hopeless. I've known worse. And, um... What's the problem about the King Alfred Cup? I said. Well, you might ask Sir Ivan where it is. At Cheltenham, I said, puzzled. They run it at Cheltenham a month on Saturday. You're talking about the race, he said. Yes, what else? The cup itself. The King Alfred Gold Cup. The chalice. A medieval, I believe. So it's not what they race for. Good heavens, no. The annual trophy for the race is just a replica. Handsome and worth a bob or two, but no more than a replica. The original cup is extremely valuable. Sir Ivan should really consider selling it to offset some of the debt. But there's some doubt as to whether it belongs to the brewery or to Sir Ivan personally. And I interrupted him. Actually, I was wondering about the race itself, not the trophy. The race is part of the brewery's prestige, and cancelling it now at this late stage, when the entries are already in, would send a massive message to all and sundry that the company is in a shaky state. Well, you'll need to say all that to the committee. She, your insolvency angel, couldn't she say it? You'll need to convince her. He paused. Oh, incidentally, among the brewery's possible assets, there is a racehorse. That's to say, it's unclear again whether it belongs to the brewery or to Sir Ivan himself. I'd be glad if you could clarify it. What's the name of the horse? How do you hide a horse, Alexander? Hide a horse? Ye gods! It's called Golden Malt, Tobias said. On the Tollright telephone, I engaged the services of the lady insolvency negotiator, a Mrs. Morden, and also made an appointment with the bank for the following morning. You can only do your best, Tobias observed. None of this is your fault. It appears you've just been dumped into it, up to the hilt. I didn't know whether to wince or smile at the familiar phrase. Up to the hilt. In a particular way, I'd been in jeopardy, up to the hilt, for the last five years. It had taken five years for the demons to arrive at my door. I said, about that horse, um, Golden Malt, did you say? Why is there a doubt about who owns it? 
Ah, you'll have to ask Sir Ivan. The horse isn't listed as an actual asset of the brewery, but the brewery has paid the training fees and claimed them against tax as an advertising expense. As I said, you'll need to sort it out. I caught a bus from Reading to Newbury. There I had time to spend some of my mother's cash on a new pair of jeans and to discard the old paint-stained denims. After another bus ride, I arrived on a Lambourne doorstep that I would have been happier to avoid. My stepfather's horses, and that included Golden Malt, and also my Uncle Robert, himself's horses, were trained at the racing town of Lambourne by a young woman, Emily Jane Cox. I arrived as she was completing her evening rounds of the stable, checking on the welfare of each of the fifty or so horses entrusted to her care. She loved the life. She loved the horses. She might once also have loved Alexander Kinloch, but she was not going to dump a busy and fulfilled career for solitude on a bare, cold mountain. I'd lived with her in Lambourne for nearly six months once, and I'd painted nothing worth looking at. It doesn't matter, she'd consoled me early on. Marry me and be content. I had married her, and after a while left her. She'd never used my name, but had become simply Mrs. Cox. What are you doing here? she asked. Ivan has had a heart attack. But he's all right, isn't he? I telephoned. Your mother said not to worry. He's not well. He asked me to look after his horses. She shrugged. Oh, you may as well set his mind at rest. She had dark hair cut like a cap, and the sort of figure that looked good in trousers. We were the same age almost to the day. Ivan had three horses in training in Emily's yard. She showed me two unremarkable bays and one bright chestnut, golden malt. He had noticeably good looks, two white socks, and a bright white blaze down his nose. He's entered for the King Alfred Gold Cup, Emily said, patting the horse's glossy neck. Ivan wants to win his own race. And will he? He won't disgrace himself. What's the matter with your eye? she asked. I got mugged. Do you want a drink? Good idea. I followed her into her house, where she led the way through the much-lived-in kitchen and into the sitting room. Still Campari? she inquired. Well, anything. I'll get some ice. I walked across the room and stood before a painting on the wall. It showed a view of windswept golf links with a silver slit of sea in the background, grey scudding clouds, and two golfers doggedly leaning face against the gale, pulling their golf clubs behind them on trolleys. I had sent the painting as a sort of peace offering. It was one of the first I'd painted after I'd left, and seeing it again brought sharply back not just the feel of the paint going onto the canvas, but also all the guilt and joyous sense of freedom of that time. Emily said behind me, One of my owners brought a friend with him a few weeks ago who spotted that painting from across the room and said, I say, is that an Alexander? I turned. She was carrying two tumblers with ice in and looking at the picture. You'd signed it just Alexander, she said. I nodded. She stared silently at the canvas and said, I didn't know. What didn't you know? Why you left? Why you couldn't paint here? You did try to tell me. I was too hurt to understand. And too young. She sighed. And nothing's changed, has it? Not really. She smiled vividly, without pain. For a marriage that lasted barely four months, ours wasn't so bad. You're generous, Em. Oh, I quite enjoy saintly forbearance. Do you want something to eat? We ate mushroom omelettes at the kitchen table. She still had a passion for ice cream, strawberry, that evening. She said, Do you want a divorce? Is that why you came here? No, I hadn't thought of it. Well, if you don't want a divorce, why did you come? Ivan wants me to make golden malt disappear. What on earth are you talking about? I explained about the brewery's financial predicament. The brewery... Emily said tartly, owes me four months training fees for golden malt. You'll get it, I promised. 
but he wants me to take the horse away from here so that it doesn't get sucked in and sold prematurely. All right. What do you want to do? To ride the horse away from here tomorrow morning when the town and the downs are alive with horses going in all directions. If Ivan wants the horse hidden, Emily said, I'll help you. So where do you plan to go? You tell me. Somewhere where he'll be out of circulation for a month. In fact, until a day or two before the King Alfred Gold Cup. The horse would have to come back here, wouldn't he, so he could run with you as trainer. She nodded, then said, I have a friend, a woman, who runs a very good livery yard. Is she within riding distance? About eight miles across the downs. She fetched the map from the office. Her yard is west of here, she said, pointing. She's quite a good way away from Mandown, where most people exercise the Lambourne strings. She's there, see, outside the village of Fox Hill. Emily phoned her friend. My yard's so full, she said. Could you take an overflow for me for a week or two? Keep him fit. He'll be racing later on. You can? Good. I'll send one of my lads over with him in the morning. The horse's name? Oh, just call him Bobby. Send me the bills. She put down the receiver. There you are. You're brilliant. Absolutely right. Where are you sleeping? I'll find a room in Lambourne. Well, not unless you want to advertise your presence. People know you here. You can sleep here, on a sofa, out of sight. How about in your bed? What an extraordinary suggestion. She no longer slept in the big bedroom we'd shared, but in the old guest room. This is not a precedent, she said, taking off layers down to a white lace bra. And I don't think it's wise. Oh, bugger wise. You obviously haven't been getting enough. No, I haven't. I switched off the lights and drew back the curtains, as I'd always done. She rustled out of the rest of her clothes and slid naked between the sheets. I did what I knew she liked, and, as ever, my own intensest pleasure came in pleasing her. When I felt her deep pulse beating, then I, too, took my own long moment. Sometimes, in the past, it had been as good as this, but not always. I've missed you, she said. In the morning, in the shower, she looked at my collection of bruises with disbelief. I told you, I said mildly. I got mugged. And how? Oh, don't come downstairs until the first lot has gone out. I'd almost forgotten I was there to steal a horse. I waited until the hooves outside had diminuendoed into the distance and went down for coffee and toast. Emily came in from the yard saying, I've saddled and bridled Golden Malt. He's all ready for you, but he's pretty fresh. Don't let him buck you off. And you'd better borrow a helmet from the cloakroom and anything else you need. I found some jodhpur boots and a padded jacket. I tied my hair up on the top of my head with a shoelace before hiding the lot under a shiny blue helmet. I slung round my neck a pair of jockey's goggles. Fine disguise for a black eye. Emily gave me a leg up on... When the hell did you last sit on a horse? she asked. Uh, some time ago. You're a bloody fool, she said. I'd reckoned that the first 300 yards might be the most difficult, as I had to go that distance along a public road to reach the track that led up to the downs. But I was lucky. There were few cars on the road, and those that were had drivers who slowed down for racehorses. Golden Malt tossed his head with pleasure and trotted jauntily up the rutted access to the downlands, which spread for 50 miles east to west along central southern England, from the Chilterns to Salisbury Plain. Strings of horses cluttered every skyline, and trainers' land rovers bumped easily in their wake. There was no great need for pinpoint accuracy at that stage of the journey, because somewhere ahead lay the oldest path in Britain, the Ridgeway, that still ran east-west between the Thames at Goring Gap and West Kennet, a village southwest of Swindon. It was likely the Druids had walked it to reach Stonehenge long before the Romans came with Julius Caesar. When I reached it, I turned left to the west. The path turned southwest at roughly where I expected, led across a minor road or two, and delivered me to Fox Hill. 
Mrs. Cox, I said, says she'll call by in a day or two to pick up the saddle and bridle. Fine, said Emily's friend. I'll be off then. Right, thanks. We'll look after the old boy. She patted the chestnut neck and nodded to me cheerfully as I left, not querying my assertion of thumbing a lift back to Lambourne. I thumbed a lift to Swindon instead, however, caught a train to Reading and called on an area bank manager who wasn't expecting a padded jacket, jodper boots and a shiny blue riding helmet with goggles. I'm sorry about the presentation, I said, recognising his misgivings. I'm acting for my stepfather, Sir Ivan Westering, and this is not my normal world. I know Sir Ivan well, he said. I'm sorry he's ill. I handed him a certified copy of The Power of Attorney and Ivan's alternate director letter. He listened courteously to my plea for the bank's support while the insolvency practitioner, Mrs. Morden, tried to put together a committee of creditors. He nodded. I've already been approached by Mrs. Morden. I've also talked to Tobias Tilwright. He told me you would come here on your knees. Well, I'll kneel if you like. The faintest of smiles twitched in his eye muscles and vanished. He said, What do you get out of this personally? Surprised, I didn't know what to say, so I didn't say anything. This didn't seem to bother him. He said, All right, the wages checks will be honoured for the time being. He stood up, holding out a smooth white hand. A revelation doing business with you, Mr. Kinloch. Mrs. Margaret Morden looked somewhere in the ageless forties and was not the severe businesswoman I'd expected. Formidable intelligence shone in steady grey eyes. However, she was dressed in a soft calf-length dress of pink and violet printed silk with a ruffle round the neck. She sat in a large black chair behind an executive-sized desk and waved me to the chair facing. There were brewery papers spread out on the desk. She said, we have here a serious situation. The serious situation was abruptly made worse by the door crashing open to admit a human missile. A thin man in his fifties, going bald, and staring through large glasses with metal rims. Mrs. Morden asked calmly, And you are? Madam, he said furiously, in the absence of Sir Ivan Westering, I am in charge of the brewery. I am the acting managing director. This young man has no authority. Your name? Finch, he said sharply. Desmond Finch. Ah, yes. Mrs. Morden looked down at the papers. It mentions you here. I'm sorry, Mr. Finch. Mr. Kinloch has an undoubted right to act in Sir Ivan's stead. Well, it's not good enough, he said furiously. I want this, this usurper out now, this minute, at once. Mrs. Benchmark is adamant. Mrs. Morden lifted her eyebrows in my direction. Uh, Mrs. Benchmark, I explained, is Patsy Benchmark, Sir Ivan's daughter. Uh, she would prefer me out of her father's life. She would prefer me, uh, to evaporate. Let me get this right, Margaret Morden said patiently. Sir Ivan is Mrs. Benchmark's actual father, and you are his stepson. I nodded. Uh, please try to save the brewery, I said. Sir Ivan's health may depend on it. And save it for Patsy. It'll be hers one day. She won't thank you, Mr. Finch, if it goes down the tubes. Finch gaped and made for the door then stopped and turned. Mrs. Benchmark says you have stolen the King Alfred Gold Cup and you're hiding it, and if necessary she will take it back by force. Hell's teeth. My ribs ached. A King Alfred Gold Cup. It. The it that the demons had been looking for. The it that I didn't have. Not the it that I did have. Finch made his exit. Mrs. Morden said, I hope to bring together the brewery's main creditors on Monday. Telephone me tomorrow for a progress report. I walked back to Pierce, Tolwright and Simmons, where the auditor and I became Tobe and Al, and went out for an early beer. I told Tobias of Desmond Finch's visit to Margaret Morden. Have you met him? I asked. Oh yes, quite often. What do you think of him? Desmond Finch is a very effective lieutenant. 
Give him a program he understands and he will unswervingly carry it out. You approve of him then? I can't stand the man. I laughed. Oh, thank God for that. We drank in harmony. I said, what was Norman Quorn like? Quorn? Oh, a grey, meticulous accountant. We went through the firm's books together every year. Never a decimal out of place. I'd have bet my reputation on his honesty. He was saving everything up for the big one. Tobias sighed. Well, he was clever. I'll give him that. How did he actually steal so much? The new-fashioned way? By wire. By electronic transfer. By routing money all over the place via ABA numbers. Those are international bank identities. And by backing up the transactions with faxed authorizations, all bearing the right identifying codes. <laughs> he was too damn clever. You see, I believed I could follow any tracks. But I've lost him somewhere in Panama. It's a job for the serious fraud people, though Sir Ivan wants to hush up the whole thing and won't call them in. And of course, it wouldn't save the brewery if he did. Side two. When I reached the house in Park Crescent, my mother opened the door. She said, Patsy is here. So is Surtees. Surtees was Patsy's husband. Surtees' benchmark was of the silly ass school, could waffle apologetically while he did you a bad turn, rather like his wife. He saw me through her eyes. They lived with their daughter Xenia on a thoroughbred stud farm just south of Hungerford. I could hear Pat. I insist, father, he's got to go. As her voice was coming from Ivan's study, I went up there with my mother following. Patsy was tall and lean and stunningly beautiful when she wanted to charm. I've been telling father, she said, that he must revoke that power of attorney he made out in your name and give it to me. I said, well, he can, of course, do what he likes. Ivan looked alarmingly pale and weak, sitting in his dark red dressing gown in his imposing chair. I went across to him, offering my arm and suggesting he should lie down. Leave him alone, Patsy said sharply. Uh, lie down, he said vaguely. Yeah, uh, good idea. He let me help him towards his bedroom. As I went past him, Surtees whispered, Next time you'll scream. Patsy's head snapped round towards her husband. Will you keep your silly mouth shut? In Ivan's bedroom, my mother and I helped him out of his dressing gown and into the wide bed, where he relaxed gratefully, closing his eyes and murmuring, Vivian, Vivian, I'm here. She stroked his hand. Go to sleep, my dear. When he was breathing evenly, my mother and I went out into the study and found that Patsy and Surtees had gone. In the morning, when everyone had slept well, I talked for much longer than previously with Ivan. I told him what Margaret Morden was trying to achieve and about the arrangements I'd made for Golden Malt. He was highly delighted. I found myself thinking that something must be done about Surtees' benchmark. I wondered who could help me, and on the spur of the moment rang Tobias Tollride. Tobe, do you know any good, honest, discreet private investigators in your area? He chuckled. Good, honest, and discreet? <laughs> uh, hang on. There was a rustle of pages. Ah, got a pencil? There was a pencil on the table, but no notepad. I turned over the box of tissues in Ivan's fashion and wrote on the bottom of it the name and phone number of a firm in Reading. I disconnected and said to Ivan, Patsy is going around telling people I've stolen the chalice, the King Alfred Cup. But, he said, undisturbed, you do have it, don't you? Why do you think I have the cup? Oh, because I sent it to you, of course. You're good at hiding things, Robert said. I sent it to you to keep it safe. Hell's teeth, I thought. How? How did you send it to me? I gave it to Robert. 
I asked your Uncle Robert to take the damned cup to Scotland for you to take care of. If you haven't got it, then he has. Who else knew you were sending the cup to me? Uh, no one else. Robert will pass the cup to you when you go back to Scotland, and you can keep it safe for me until the brewery's affairs are settled. Because, like the horse, the cup belongs to me. When did all this happen? Oh, uh, sometime last week, while you were still in the clinic. Yes. Robert came to visit me and said he was leaving the next day for Scotland. It made sense to ask him to look after the cup, and he said he would, but better still, he would entrust it to you. I asked if he trusted you enough, and he said he would trust you with his life. Next time you'll scream, Surtees had said. Uh, did you tell Patsy that I was looking after the cup? Well, she came to the clinic every day, you know. She looked after my flowers, and perhaps she was in and out when Robert came. But I can't think how she thought you had stolen the cup. Uh, you must be mistaken about that, you know. I trekked back by rail to Reading, and went to see the firm of Young and Utley, the investigators recommended by Tobias. An unprepossessing male voice on the telephone having given me a time and a place, I found a soulless box of an office with a single inhabitant, a man of about my own age, dressed in jeans, black boots, a grubby singlet with cut-out armholes, and a heavy black hip-slung belt shining with studs. He had an unshaven chin, close-cropped dark hair, and one earring dangling from his right ear. Yeah? Want something? said the voice I had heard on the phone. I'm looking for Young and Utley. I telephoned. Yeah? You see, Young and Utley are partners. That's their pictures on the wall there. Which one do you want? He pointed to two photographs drawing pinned to a cork board hanging on a dingy wall. Mr. Young and Mr. Utley were, first, a sober, dark-suited man with a heavy moustache, a striped tie and a hat, and, secondly, a wholesome fellow in a pale blue jogging suit carrying a football and a whistle. I turned away, smiling, and said to the skinhead, I'll take you as you are. What do you mean? Well, those pictures are both you. Oh, quick, aren't you? Yeah. Tobe warned me. Well, I asked for someone good, honest, and discreet. You got him. What do you want done? I want you to follow someone and find out if he meets or knows where to find four other people. I drew them for him in a mixture of pencil and ballpoint, having somewhere lost my charcoal. He looked at the drawings, one of Surtees' benchmark, and one of each of my four attackers. I told him Surtees' name and address. I said I knew nothing about the others except their ability to punch. Are those for how you got your black eye? Yes. They robbed my house in Scotland, but they have South East England voices. I paid him a retainer for a week, gave him Jed's phone number, and asked him to report. Uh, what do I call you? I asked. Young or Utley? Take your pick. Young and utterly outrageous. I said. I spent the later part of the afternoon shopping, replacing everything that had been stolen, accompanied by my long-suffering mother, who paid with her credit cards. Back at Park Crescent, I changed into some of the new things, and left the jodper boots, padded jacket, crash helmet and goggles for return to Emily sometime. And I told Ivan, having checked with Margaret Morton, that the brewery's creditors had agreed to meet on Monday. After dinner, I humped my bags and boxes along to Euston, boarded the Royal Highlander, and slept my way to Scotland. At Dalwhinnie Station, Jed Parlane was striding up and down to keep warm. He drove me straight to Kinloch Castle to talk to himself. The castle had been heavily constructed to keep out both enemies and weather. It was of thick and plain perpendicular grey stone, with a minimum of narrow windows that had once been arrow slots for archers. It no longer belonged to the Kinloch family, 
but was the property of Scotland, administered and run as a tourist attraction by one of the conservation organisations. Himself had pronounced the roof upkeep and the heating bills too much for even the Kinloch coffers, and had negotiated a retreat to a smaller, snugger home in what had once been the kitchen wing. About six years earlier, an enterprising band of burglars had lifted and borne away an irreplaceable leafed 18th century dinner service for 50. It had been less than a year later, when a second theft had deprived the castle of several tapestry wall hangings, that himself had thought of a way of keeping safe the best-known Alice of the many Kinloch treasures, the jewel-encrusted solid gold hilt of the ceremonial sword of Prince Charles Edward Stuart, Bonnie Prince Charlie. It had, of course, meant taking the hilt out of its supposedly thief-proof display case and replacing the real thing with a replica. Ever since he had whisked the genuine article to safety, himself had politely refused to tell the castle's administrators where to find it. It belonged to him, he maintained, as it had been given personally by Prince Charles Edward to his ancestor, the Earl of Kinloch at that time, and had been handed down to him, the present Earl, in the direct male line. So had the castle, the administrators said, the hilt belonged to the nation. Ill-feeling flew like barbs in the air. The castle's administrators were now hell-bent on appropriating the hilt, but first they had to find it. My uncle was in his dining room, dressed in tweeds, and pouring coffee from a pot on the sideboard. Alexander! My lord. He nodded, smiled, and gestured to the coffee. Breakfast? Thank you. He took his cup over to the table and began eating toast. Two places had been laid, and he waved me to the free one. That's laid for you, he said. Your aunt stayed in London. He was a tall man, topping me by at least four inches, and broad-built. At sixty-five he had grey hair showing a white future, a strong nose, heavy chin, and guarded eyes. Jed told me what happened at the Bothy. He wanted the details, so I gave them to him. I also told him about Ivan's problems, about him giving me the power of attorney, and my experiences in Reading. Eventually I said, so, do you have the King Alfred Gold Cup? Is it here? I did tell Ivan you were good at hiding things, he said. Well, probably someone heard you. What do you mean? I think it was the chalice, not the hilt, that those men were trying to find at the Bothy. I also think they hadn't been told precisely what they were looking for. They kept saying, where is it? But they didn't say what they meant by it. I thought at the time they meant the hilt, because I didn't know Ivan had given you the carp. I sighed. Anyway, I'd say now the it was definitely the carp. Was it my fault? It was Norman Corn's fault for running off with the brewery's cash. But mine for suggesting you to Ivan? It's history, I replied. After breakfast, my uncle and I left the dining room and walked outside round the whole ancient complex, as he liked to do. I told Ivan I wanted to get the cup valued. If he wanted me to get you to look after it, I had to know its worth. What did he say? I had to assure him I wouldn't take it to anyone that would recognize it. The valuer summoned to the castle was neither an auctioneer nor a jeweller, but a thin eighty-year-old woman, a retired lecturer in English from St Andrews University, Dr Zoe Lang, with a comet tale of distinguished qualifications after her name. My uncle explained to me that she lived close by and was an advisor to the castle's administrators. When she arrived, himself led the way into the dining room, where he sat his guest at the table. Al, there's a box in the sideboard, right-hand cupboard. Put it on the table, would you? I found and carried across a large brown cardboard box, stuck all over with sticky tape and conspicuously marked in big black handwritten capitals, books. Open it, Al, 
himself instructed. Dr. Zoe Lang had straight grey hair looped back into a loose bun on her neck. She wore glasses and lipstick and clothes too large for her thin frame. Something about her all the same warned one not to think in terms of dry old virginal spinster. I ripped off the sticky tape and opened the box and found inside, as promised, books. Old editions of Dickens, to be precise. Keep going, Al. I lifted out the books and came to a grey duster cloth drawstring bag enclosing another box. It was of black leather with gold clasps. Between the clasps, stamped in small gold letters, were the words Maxim London. I pushed it across the table to himself. Dr. Lang, he said courteously, pushing the box on, do us the honor. She undid the clasps and opened it. Well, well, she said. Inside the box, supported by white satin-covered cushioning, the King Alfred Gold Cup lay on its side. It was a wide round bowl on a sturdy neck with a spreading foot. The rim of the bowl was crenellated. Its sides glittered with red, blue and green inlaid stones, and it shone with the warm, unmistakable golden glow of twenty-two carats at least. Dr. Lang lifted out the astonishing object and stood it on the polished wood of the table. She cleared her throat. Sad as I am to see it, this cup is modern, she announced. Modern, himself echoed. Certainly not medieval, regretted the expert. Almost certainly Victorian. 1860 or thereabouts, very handsome, beautiful even, but not old. The cup had what looked like a pattern engraved right round the top, below the crenellations, and again round the lower third of the bowl. Dr. Lang looked at the patterns and smiled. Ah, the cup is engraved with a poem in Anglo-Saxon she said, but it's still Victorian, and I doubt if those coloured stones are rubies and emeralds, though you'd need to get an informed opinion for that. Can you read the poem? I asked. She fingered the bands of engraving. This is Bede's death song. Hmm. Very famous. Bede died in 735, long before King Alfred was born. She turned the cup round, searching for the beginning of the verse. In literal translation, it says, Before that sudden journey, no one is wiser in thought than he needs to be in considering before his departure what will be adjudged to his soul of good or evil after his death day. Her old voice held the echo of years of lecturing to students, the authority of confident scholarship. Bede's death song's message was of taking stock of the good and evil one did on earth because hell after death was a certainty. Unimaginable centuries later, I believed that the only real hell was on earth and usually undeserved. But I was not going to discuss this with Zoe Lang. So how much, himself was asking his expert, how much should one insure this cup for? She pursed her lips. Not more than it's worth in gold, I wouldn't think. Its weight in gold wouldn't save the brewery or go any acting even a significant naught. My uncle thoughtfully restored the cup to its box and closed the lid. He thanked her warmly for her trouble and offered her wine or tea. What I would like, she said, is to see the Kinloch hilt. Himself blinked. Uh, we have only the replica on show. The real one, she said. Show me the real one. Under the present circumstances, he said, his eyes twinkling, 
I find myself unable to oblige you. She smiled tightly and settled for a sight of the copy. We walked down a long passage and himself unlocked the door that led us into the castle proper. We walked down the great hall under its high vaulted ceiling until we came to the imposing grilled glass display unit at the far end that had once held the true honor of the Kinlochs. Himself flicked a switch. Lights inside the glass case came to brilliant life. The replica hilt lay on black velvet, and even though one knew it wasn't the real thing, it looked immensely impressive. It is gold-plated, its owner said. The red stones are spinel, not ruby. The blue stones are lapis lazuli. The green ones are peridots. I commissioned it and paid for it, and no one disputes that this is mine. Dr. Zoe Lang studied it carefully and in silence. She said intensely, This imitation may be your own, but I agree with the castle's custodians that the real honor of the Kinlochs belongs to Scotland. Do you think so? himself asked politely, good manners and jocularity in his voice. I would defend my right of ownership. He paused. Yes? He smiled sweetly. To the hilt. After seeing Zoe Lang out, himself and I re-enclosed the black cube in its drawstring bag and replaced it in the cardboard box with the copies of Dickens on top. We put the box back in the sideboard. We can't leave it there forever, my uncle said. No. Think of somewhere better, Al. I'll try. Jed came back to the castle late in the afternoon, still with my gear in the boot of his car, wanting to know if he could drive me home to the Bothy. No, himself said decisively. I see Al seldom enough. He will stay here tonight and tomorrow night to please me, and on Monday morning you can take him to the Bothy and the police station and anywhere else you care to. He outlined his plans for the week and added, James returns from sailing tomorrow. He'll be staying on here. His wife will take the children back to school. All clear, Jed? Yes, sir. Jed and he discussed estate affairs for a while, and I listened with half an ear and tried to think of a good temporary home for Bede's death song, engraved in gold. Any thoughts anyone might have had about a peaceful evening were soon blasted apart by the earthquake arrival of himself, son and heir, my cousin James, who had listened to a gale and rain weather forecast and decided to run for port a day early, along with his boisterous family. When the invasion stampeded upstairs to arrange bedrooms, I telephoned my mother and asked after Ivan. Things were no worse. No further crisis in the brewery's affairs. Bankruptcy had gone into hiatus for the weekend. James, red-haired and freckled, wandering by with a gin and tonic in fist, asked amiably how the old boy was doing. Depressed, I said. Father says someone decamped with the brewery's nest egg. Yes, nest egg, chickens, battery ends, the lot. What a lark, eh? On Sunday morning, when I went downstairs in search of coffee, I found himself in the dining room looking in bewilderment at an empty cardboard box, old copies of Dickens, an empty black cube, and a grey drawstring duster bag, all lying haphazardly on the floor. The sideboard door stood open. The King Alfred gold cup had gone. There were squeals from next door, children's voices. My uncle opened the door, and I followed him into the kitchen. James was leaning against the sink, coffee mug in hand. His three children, two boys and a girl, scrambled around on the floor, all of them wearing large saucepans on their heads and the handles pointing backwards. The King Alfred cup also stood on the floor, 
upside down. Himself, Benton picked it up. Hey, objected his elder grandson, that's the galactic core of M100, with all its sea-feared variables in those red stones. We have to keep it safe from the black hole suction mob. I'm glad to hear it, his grandfather said dryly. The boy, Andrew, was 11 years old. If time took its normal course, he would one day succeed James as Earl. Can we have it back? No. Himself thrust the cup into my arms. Put it away safely, he said. In the afternoon, James and I played golf. We drove over in good time for the pro shop to kit me out with better clubs than the ones I'd lost. And for good measure, I acquired snazzy black and white shoes, gloves, balls, and an umbrella. Also a lightweight blue waterproof golf bag and a trolley. Thus re-equipped, I went out with my cousin into the wind and rain and got happily soaked to the skin, despite our umbrellas. Will you paint this? James asked, squelching on wet grass. Yes, of course. I parted a ball to the rim of a hole where it obstinately stopped. I paint frustration, I said, and gave the ball a kick. In good spirits, we finished the 18 holes and went back to the castle. The only really warm room in the whole castle complex was the home of the vast hot water tank, where ranks of errors dried out the persistent Scottish rains. James and I accordingly showered, changed, and left all our wet things steaming, including my sopping new shoes and golf bag. It was still raining on Monday morning. James took his family to the airport on their way south, himself left to meet guests and gillies at Crathy to bother the silver swimmers in the spay, and Jed arrived to set my life back on course. He brought with him a replacement credit card and checkbook, which he had had sent to his house. He had freed one of the estate's Land Rovers for my temporary use, and he lent me a fully charged portable phone. There's a new lock on the bossy, and here are two keys, he said, handing them over. I have the third. I went out with him and found the boxes from London that I'd left in his car already piled into the Land Rover. I'd taken into himself's house only clothes in a paper carrier, and I left with them dry in an all-purpose heavy-duty duffel bag from the gun room. Jed commented on my new golf clubs, said, but this time I'm storing my kit in the clubhouse. On my way to the Bothy, I stopped briefly at the golf club to pay for the new golf gear and unload it into a locker. At the Bothy, I found the same devastation that I'd left there six days earlier. I dug out of the mess a plastic rubbish bag and filled it with the debris of ruined acrylics and everything small but broken. My mattress and bedding were soaked and smelling from a bucket full of dirty paint water. I wasn't sure what they'd done to my armchair, but it too smelled revolting. Bastards. Bit by bit, I stacked my ruined possessions in the carport, painstakingly looking for anything not mine that might have been left behind by my attackers. When I'd finished, all that was left in the room was the bare bedstead, the chest of drawers, empty, one shelf of salvaged books, a frying pan with cooking tools, and one easel, two broken. Then I swept the floor. The only thing I found that I hadn't had before was a pair of plastic-framed glasses. They were, I thought, the sort of aid one could buy off revolving stand displays all over the world. They were the sort of glasses worn by my attackers. A disguise. A theatrical prop. I carted the bags and boxes of new gear into the bothy from the Land Rover and stacked everything unopened on the bed. Then I drove off in search of Detective Sergeant Berwick. 
Within five minutes of arriving at Dalhwini police station, the detective sergeant had told me he implacably disliked drug dealers, prostitutes, Englishmen, the Celtic football team, and all superior officers. He also told me not to expect to get my goods back. I said, I was wondering if you might have some luck with the paintings. He peered at a list. Oh yes, here we are. Four paintings of scenes of golf courses. He looked up. Is there any way we could recognize them? Well, they had stickers on the back in the top left-hand corner, I said. Copyright stickers giving my name, Alexander, and this year's date. Uh, stickers can be pulled off. These stickers can't. The glue bonds with the canvas. Well, you could put another sticker over the top, he said. Well, yes, you could, I agreed. But you might not know my name is printed in an ink that shows up in x-rays. Uh, we'll see what we can do, he promised. I'll paint your portrait if you find my pictures. He spread out on his desk the drawings I'd done at the Dalhwini station of my assailants. Uh, I'll paint my wife, he said. A few doors along from the police station, I acquired a sleeping bag and enough essentials to make living in the Bothy possible, and then drove home. Once there, I sat in the Land Rover and made use of Jed's portable phone. I phoned Margaret Morton. She said, At the creditors' meeting, I laid out all the figures. They all needed smelling salts, but I've persuaded the bank and the Inland Revenue to try to come up with solutions, and we're meeting again on Wednesday. The best that one can say is that the brewery is basically still trading at a profit. I wanted to paint. I had to instruct myself severely that two more phone calls had to be made before I could prepare a canvas ready for morning. Tack cotton duck onto a stretched frame. Prime three times with gesso to produce a good surface. Let it dry. Lay on the panes grey mixed with titanium white. I phoned my mother. Ivan was no worse, no better. He still wanted me to act for him. The real trouble at present, my mother said, is Surtees. What about him? He's paranoid. In what way? Well, he says he's being followed everywhere by a skinhead. What? I know, it's stupid. No one else has seen this skinhead. Pats is livid with him. I do wish they wouldn't crowd in here all the time. Ivan needs rest and quiet. Come back, Alexander, please. I wanted to paint. As soon as I rang off, Jed phoned. He said, All hell has broken loose at the castle. What sort of hell? Andy, himself's young grandson, has run off with the King Alfred Gold Cup. I laughed. Uh, what exactly happened? It seemed that soon after himself and his guests returned to the castle for tea, Dr. Zoe Lang had made an unheralded return visit, bringing with her an expert in precious and semi-precious stones. She couldn't rest, she said, while her evaluation of the King Alfred Cup was incomplete. The cardboard box had been retrieved from the sideboard, the black leather cube had been lifted out, and the gold clasp undone, and in the white satin nest, nothing. My cousin James, who'd returned from seeing his family onto the air shuttle from Glasgow to London, had instantly nominated his elder son, who'd been fascinated by the cup, as prime suspect. But young Andrew could not at that moment be reached for questioning, as he was by then somewhere on the road back to boarding school. Jed said, I called in to see himself. And I found this old lady telling him that he shouldn't be trusted to keep the Kinloch hilt safe if he couldn't guard things from his own grandson. After she'd gone, he asked me to ask you if you thought he ought to worry about Andrew. Tell him the boy is innocent, I said with a grin. On Tuesday morning, I set to work. 
On the grey-white underpainting, I lightly drew in pencil the head of a still young woman with a face already strongly defined by character, a face of good bone structure, of intelligence, of purpose. I painted the whole head in light and dark intensities of ultramarine blue, mostly transparent, mixed with water. I painted dark blue shadows round the edges of the canvas, leaving light areas round the head itself, and worked dark shadows round the eyes and under the chin, until I had a fairly complete monochrome portrait in blue on light grey. She looked, as I thought Dr. Zoe Lang might have looked, forty years earlier. In the afternoon, I overpainted the background with browns and crimsons, glazing and rubbing together the colours in the method called scumbling, until I had a deep, rich background that receded from the eye, leaving the face itself startlingly near and clear. Early on Wednesday, I began overpainting flesh onto the blue bones, working from light areas to dark, giving her strength and brain. By afternoon, she was a woman who would both excel in an academic world and comfort a strong man in bed. Or so, in my mind, I saw her. That night, I entrusted the picture to Jed for safekeeping, returned the Land Rover and phone, and took the night train to London. Ivan, looking exhausted, greeted me with a weak smile. That woman wants you to phone her, he said, pointing at the tissue box. I turned it over and found Margaret Morden's number written one word message, now. I phoned her, now. Sir Ivan said you'd be coming to London. I'm here. Can you hop down to my office? I'll be there in an hour and a half. Before I set off, Ivan said, I'm adding a codicil to my will. Don't let anyone stop me. By anyone, do you mean Patsy? Yes, Patsy, he nodded. And Surtees and Oliver Grantchester. Oliver Grantchester? Well, your lawyer. Patsy gets him to tell her things. Did you tell Oliver Grantchester you wanted to add a codicil and he told Patsy? Yes. Oliver says she's family. He should be struck off. I asked him to come tomorrow morning, so please, Alexander, if I were you, I said, I would take a piece of paper here and now and simply write down in your own handwriting what you want and then get Wilfred and Lois to witness you signing Unless, of course, they are recipients. He shook his head. And then the codicil would be done and legal, and you wouldn't have to endure any arguments. He liked the idea. The only thing is, I said, don't leave me anything. If you do, the codicil will be declared void, as Patsy will say I influenced you. But, no, don't, I said. Eh, you're as bossy as Patsy. I fetched paper and a pen from his desk and watched him write a scant half-page. Then I sought out Wilfred and Lois, and Ivan himself asked them to witness his signature. When they had gone, I gave Ivan an envelope for his codicil. When he'd stuck down its flap, he signed his name and the date twice across the join. He held out the sealed envelope for me to take. Look after it he said. I took the envelope. Horse, cup, codicil. What else? The creditors, Margaret Morden reported, had worked out a rate of payment that they would accept. Their terms were stringent, which I should expect, but just about possible if sales held up. The creditors conceded that good sales depended on the brewery's solid reputation, and they had included the King Alfred Gold Cup race's expenses in their calculations. Great, I said. You're brilliant. Yes, but if there's any shortfall in the expected receipts for the next six months, Sir Ivan will forfeit the cup itself. 
The same applies to the horse Golden Malt. She paused. At present, no one at the brewery seems to know exactly where either the horse or cup have got to. I see, I said non-committally. Is there anything I should do now? I added. You have to sign the agreements drawn up yesterday, then Tobias Tolwright will okay the audit, and King Alfred's brewery will stay in business. When we had done all that had to be done, we met Tobe in a pub. We sat round a small table and toasted the brewery's survival in a bottle of good Bordeaux. Afterwards, I went to see Young and Utley. Alone in occupation, I found a secretary at work at a computer, a young woman with dark curly hair, black tights, short black skirt, loose bright blue sweater, scarlet lips and fingernails. Can I help you? Well, I looked at her carefully. Well, you can tell me why the hell you let Surtees Benchmark see you following him. The busy fingers stilled. The voice deepened and said in exasperation, How the shit do you know? I draw people. I look at their bones. Your eye sockets slant down in a particular way at the outer corners. Also, your wrists are male. You should wear frilled cuffs. Bugger you! I laughed. So why did you let Surtees see you? Let him? I made sure he did. You see, if someone knows they're being followed, they're dead careful. But when they don't see their shadow, they think they're safe. So they go at once and do what you could wait weeks for them to do otherwise. You see? Well, I guess I do. So I got him busy looking out for a skinhead. And, I suggested, he then doesn't notice a secretary in a dark brown wig. You got it. And what did the secretary see? On Wednesday afternoons, it seems Mrs. Patsy Benchmark chairs some sort of local women's action committee and her mister is off the leash. Yesterday afternoon, yesterday being Wednesday, Surtees drives around in a circle or two looking out for the skinhead and when he thinks it's safe, off he goes to a terrace house on the outskirts of Guildford. And... And, as soon as Surtees had left, our Mr. Young paid a visit to the house in question. Our Mr. Young in suit, hat, moustache? He nodded. Yeah, that Mr. Young. And, and, there's a little cow lives there that lets inadequates like Surtees pay to spank her before sex. Regular customer he is, apparently. Whatever next, I said. There's no limit to the man's talents, or to yours. Oh, <laughs> thank you, said the secretary with a flutter of eyelashes. Now, what's next on the agenda? Right, see what you can find out about a goldsmith working in London in around 1850 or 60 called Maxim. Anything else? Yes. How do you rate as a bodyguard? I returned to London and reported to Ivan. When my mother came into his room, he picked up a thick batch of paper and a blue cover and waved it at her. This is our annual audit. Tobias Tollwright has signed it. It's our passport to continue trading. The creditors' terms for payment are tough. They're very tough, but, well, they've been fair. We ought to be able to win our way back. One could actually see his resolution trickling back. Well done, Alexander, he said. Oh no, thank Mrs. Morden. It was all her work. I had expected, since he'd written his codicil, that he would have told his lawyer not to bother to come the next day. But it seemed he'd forgotten to cancel the meeting, and Oliver Granchester arrived punctually at ten o'clock. Minutes later, Patsy appeared like a ship under full sail, Surtees following in her wake. You are not making any codicil, father, unless I'm sure Alexander, Patsy spat the word, doesn't in any way benefit. My dear, Ivan told her pleasantly, I'm not writing any codicil this morning. Uh, but you said you arranged for Oliver to come. Yes, I know, but I wrote my codicil yesterday. It's all done. 
Well, at least uh, let me check it from the legal point of view, Grantchester said. Ivan, with a touch of starch, told him that he, Ivan, knew when a document had been correctly executed. I don't understand you, Grantchester began. I do. Patsy said forcefully. It's quite clear that Alexander is manipulating you, Father, and you can't see that everything he does is aimed at taking my place as your heir. Poor Ivan had to bear the brunt of an interminable verbal onslaught, an ordeal that was the last thing his fragile constitution needed. Eventually the opposition forces withdrew and promising to return. Silence reigned, but only for a moment then the phone rang. A voice said, This is Detective Constable Thompson of the Leicestershire Police. I want to talk to Sir Ivan Westering. I explained that Sir Ivan was recovering from a heart attack and offered my services. And you are, sir? His son. Well, near enough. After a pause, a different voice identified himself as Detective Chief Inspector Reynolds and inquired whether Sir Ivan knew anyone named Norman Corn. Yes, he does. It seemed that the Leicestershire police had for two weeks been trying to identify a body that they now had reason to believe was that of a Mr. Norman Corn. The chief inspector wanted Sir Ivan Westering, as Mr. Corn's long-term employer, to assist in making a positive identification. Well, doesn't he have any relations? I said. Only his sister, sir, and she is uh, distressed. The sister gave us Sir Ivan's name, so we would be grateful, sir. In the end, four of us went to Leicestershire in Ivan's rover. Ivan and my mother in the back, with Wilfred sitting in the front beside me, a box of heart attack remedies on his lap. Early in the afternoon, we arrived at a featureless building in Leicester that housed a mortuary and investigating laboratories. The detective chief inspector met us inside the building in a small reception area that doubled as waiting room. A large, weeping woman was being comforted by an equally large, uniformed policewoman. The chief inspector indicated that we should wait there while he took Ivan to see the body. But Ivan wouldn't go without me. We were then issued with disposable gowns, with gloves, overshoes, and masks for our noses and mouths. We went down a passage into a white-painted room that smelled of disinfectant. On a high center table under a white cover lay a long, quiet shape. Ivan looked steadily at the white face revealed when an attendant pulled back one end of the covering sheet, and he said, without wavering, Yes, that's Norman. Thank you, sir. I said, what did he die of? There was a pause. I'll take you back to your wife, sir, the policeman said to Ivan, leaving me behind alone to hear the answer to my question. The mortuary attendant identified himself as the pathologist who'd carried out the original post-mortem. So, what did he die of? I repeated. We're not sure, he shrugged. There are no obvious causes of death, no evidence of murder. He didn't die where he was found, which was in a rubbish dump. I saw him in situ. He'd been placed there after death. A heart attack, stroke, pneumonia, I hazarded. More likely one of the first two, though we can't know for sure. But there is an abnormality. He stripped back the sheet as far as the body's waist, showing the dark discolorations of decomposition and the efforts made to tidy up the radical post-mortem incisions. Look at his back, the pathologist instructed. With his gloved hands, he gripped the shoulders and half rolled the body towards him. There were about a dozen or more rows of darker marks in the darkened flesh and flecks of white. The pathologist eased the body flat again. Those white bits, did you see them? They're his ribs. I felt nauseous and swallowed. The pathologist said, those darker marks are burns. 
burns. Yes. The skin and flesh have been burned away in a few places, down to the ribs. He must have fallen into something very hot when he died. Something like a grating. Any thoughts? My chief thought was how soon I could leave the mortuary. He was wearing a nylon shirt, the pathologist said, and there were man-made fibres in the lining and cloth of his suit jacket. They melted to some extent into his skin. In another minute I thought I would vomit. With relief I rejoined the group in the entrance area. Where exactly did you find Mr. Corn? I asked the chief inspector. Instead of directly answering, he explained that the still quietly weeping woman was Norman Corn's sister. My mother had taken over from the policewoman the role of comforter. Mr. Corn, the chief inspector resumed, was found by council workers who went to clear away a rubbish dump left behind on a farmer's land when a band of travellers moved on. We made lengthy inquiries among the travellers, but drew a total blank. Neither Ivan nor my mother told him that the brewery's funds had vanished with the finance director. And nor did I. Ivan would have to think it through and decide. End of side two. Side three. Back in London, we spent the evening discussing the death of Norman Corn. Ivan finally decided the police should be informed about the missing funds. In the morning, I rang Margaret Morden at her home. It's Saturday, she said tartly. I do know. Then it had better be important. The finance director has turned up dead. She thought briefly and said, Phone me in the office on Monday. If what's bothering you most is the status of the creditors' agreements, my first impression is that they will stand. You're a doll. No, I am definitely not. I put down the receiver with a smile and drove back to Leicester. The chief inspector's reaction was as expected. Why didn't you tell me this yesterday? The brewery has hushed up the theft. I see. But what I don't understand, I went on, was what he was doing in Leicestershire. The body, said the chief inspector reflectively, was dressed in suit, shirt, tie, smart socks and polished shoes. Not the clothes one associates with a tip on a campsite anywhere, never mind Leicestershire. There were a few blades of mown grass in his clothes. That would jump back onto a barbecue of some sort. Hardly the right clothes for a barbecue either, I said. He shrugged. I'll complete my case notes with what you've told me. I appreciate your help. And give my regards to Sir I'm. On Monday, I took the train again to Reading and went first to Tobias Tolwright's office. Old Corn's dead, Tobias exclaimed. Then where's the money? I said... Well, I thought you might be able to work it out. Well, as you know, I followed him to Panama. How many stops to Panama? I asked. Wire transfer from the brewery to a bank in Guernsey. The bank there already had instructions to transfer the whole amount, multiple millions, to a bank in New York, which already held instructions to wire the money onward to a branch of global credit in Panama, but not into which account there. But they must know. Well, perhaps, but it's against their law to pass the information on. Well, not to the police or the tax people, especially not to the police or the tax people. Tobe smiled. You're an infant, Al. I then walked to the office of Young and Utley. The solitary occupant was a young man dressed in jeans, shirt and sweater, no tie, trainers and clean hands, very short, light brown hair. What's your name? I asked. Chris. Chris Young? He nodded. Yeah, I've done a bit of uh, let your fingers do the walking for you, he said. The skinhead, the secretary and Chris Young 
all spoke with the same voice. There was a goldsmith named of Maxim working in London in the 1800s. Ritzy made fancy things like peacocks for table ornaments. I made a drawing of King Alfred's golden chalice and he phoned to his goldsmith informant with a detailed description. And it has engraved round it some sort of verse in Anglo-Saxon, Chris told him. Now see what you can do. He put down the receiver. While we waited, he said, Oh, boxing gyms, uh, your spanking pal Surtees benchmark never goes near a gym, and none of the gyms in his area have ever heard of him. We sat and chatted until his phone rang. He listened and said, Thank you, thank you, half a dozen times, and wrote a few words onto a notepad, and then disconnected. Your chalice, he said, was made in 1867 to the order of a Mr. Hanworth Hill of Wantage, Berkshire. It cost an arm and a leg because it was solid gold inlaid with emeralds, sapphires and rubies. Real ones? Yeah, real ones. Well, well. Maybe my luck's changing, I said. Returning to Park Crescent, I was met by my mother, who told me that I should telephone Emily immediately. I phoned her. Golden Malt got loose on the downs at Foxhill, she said. Well, surely he'll turn up. He has turned up. He's found his way back here. Oh, bugger. And I've had a phone call from Surtees. He says he's coming to collect him. He said what? He says the horse is Patsy's. I took a steadying breath. The horse is Ivan's. Well, he's bringing a trailer to collect Golden Malt and take him to his stud farm for safekeeping. When do you expect him? He'll be on his way already. How did Surtees know you have the horse back? I asked. I don't know, but he also knows he was at Fox Hill. One of my lads must have said something. All right, I'll come as soon as I can. Don't let Surtees take Golden Malt. She said despairingly, but how do I stop him? I took with me the riding gear I had borrowed. Taxi, train and taxi got me there faster than driving, but Surtees got there first. He had brought with him an assistant horse handler in the shape of his nine-year-old daughter, Xenia. Surtees, Xenia, Emily and Golden Malt were all out in the stable yard, Emily holding the horse by his bridle. Emily's Land Rover stood in the driveway behind Surtees' trailer, effectively blocking his way out. The exit on the far side of the yard was impassable, as it seemed a lorry delivering hay had carelessly shed its load of bales there. Most convenient. Emily looked relieved to see me, Surtees furious. Xenia gave me a head-to-toe sneer. Good afternoon, Surtees, I said. Uh, having trouble? That horse is Patsy's, and I'm taking it, he replied. It's Ivan's, and I'm looking after Ivan's things, as you know. Xenia was dressed in riding clothes. She was carrying a riding crop. Not a bad kid, fair-haired, blue-eyed, hopelessly spoiled. Why aren't you in school? I asked. I have riding lessons on Monday afternoons, and it's none of your business. Surtees made a sudden charge at me while my attention was on Xenia, and with his shoulder cannonballing into my stomach, knocked me down. He fell on top of me. I rolled over, trying to disconnect myself and stand up. I could hear Xenia screaming, Kill him, Daddy, kill him! Surtees clutched my hair and tried to bang my head on the ground, while Xenia danced around us, lashing out at me with a riding crop. I finally scrambled to my feet, dragging Surtees up with me. Xenia hit my legs. Surtees tried to clout to my head. I ducked and flung him with all my strength away from me. He staggered backwards and cracked his head against a stable wall. It stunned him. He slid to his knees. Xenia screamed, You've killed my daddy! I wrapped my arms round her writhing little body, lifting her off her feet, and yelled to Emily, Are any of these boxes empty? The end too! she shouted, and struggled to hold Golden Malt in control, the horse stamping around, upset by the noise. I carried the struggling child to the end of the row, dropped her over the lower half of the box door, then closed the top half and slid home a bolt. I unbolted and opened both halves of the box next door, 
and locked the stunned Surtees inside. Now what? Emily said. We take to the hills again. I rather thought you might. I was just saddling him when Surtees came. The saddle is over there in his box. I found the saddle which I carried back and fixed in place. There was a full net of hay in the box also and a head collar. I threaded them together with the zipped bag I'd brought, taking out the helmet but slinging the rest over the withers of the horse in front of the saddle, like saddlebags of yore. Now I bolt you into Golden Malt's box so that none of this is your fault, I said. I took the reins from Emily and walked with her to the empty box. She went inside and I bolted the bottom half of the door. I kissed her over the stable door twice, locked her into her temporary prison, then hauled myself into Golden Malt's saddle and set off. The road on Lamborn to my eyes, featureless. I'd been up there fairly often with Emily and her Land Rover, but it had been five or six years ago. I looked back and could no longer distinguish the track home. It would be dark in an hour or so. Golden Malt trotted happily the length of Mandan, his regular exercise ground. It was when I stopped at the far end and didn't turn his head back towards home that he grew restive. I patted his neck and talked to him as Emily would have done. Never mind, old fellow, never mind, we're safe out here, I murmured over and over, and it was the lack of panic in the voice of confidence that I think calmed him. Unwelcome though the thought had been, I'd accepted that we might have to stay on the downs all night. What I needed was the sort of shelter farmers built at a distance from their home yards, providing walls and roofs against hail and gales, and troughs for their stock to drink from. The first two such shelters I came to were both filthy inside, thick with droppings. More importantly, golden malt wouldn't drink the water. I had to trust to his equine sense. The third shelter looked just as unappetizing, but Golden Malt walked into it amiably and then came out and drank from the trough even before I'd removed bits and pieces from the water's surface. I walked back in with him and found an iron ring let into the wall. Exchanging the bridle for the head collar, I fastened the horse into his new quarters and positioned the hay net where he could eat when he wanted. I unsaddled him and took the saddle outside. Although the temperature dropped with darkness, I felt more at home in the open beside the entrance than inside with the horse. So I unzipped the holdall and put on the padded jacket. Then I folded the holdall thickly to make a cushion and propped the saddle against the wall for a chair back and reckoned I'd spent far worse hours on Scottish mountains. After dark, the clear sky blazed with depths of stars. Inside the shelter, Golden Malt steadily chomped on his hay and made me feel hungry. I scooped a handful of water out of the trough. I drifted and dozed and woke shivering in the first grey promise of light. Golden Malt was pawing the ground, telling me that he'd finished his hay. I undid his head collar and took him outside for a drink. He walked around a bit, head down, munching grass, while I held his rope and thought of coffee and toast. As daylight arrived, I saddled and bridled him in the shelter. Finally, when the first exercise strings would be peopling the landscape, I heaved myself and gear onto his back and set about completing the disappearing trick. I rode to the east, towards the strengthening light. Not far ahead, I would come to the road from Wantage to Hungerford, and I wanted to cross that to reach the wide expanse of open downland on the far side, where many trainers had their yards but wouldn't know by sight a horse from Lambourne. I came to the main road and crossed. I was now on the wide lands south of Wantage, with five or six miles available in most directions to find a suitable string of horses to attach myself to. Just when I thought I'd drawn a blank and was in trouble, I came across four horses plodding homeward after first lot, one of them being led by a lad on foot. I followed at a distance and was conducted down a track towards a village. A sign identified it as East Ilsley. 
on through the village, and the horses turned in between the peeling gates of a small stable yard. A motor horse box stood in the yard with a trainer's name and phone number painted on it. I retraced Golden Malt's steps to a phone box we'd passed, and juggling with reins and coins took the trainer away from his breakfast. I want an owner who was also an amateur jockey. I'd just had a blazing row on the downs with my trainer and had ridden off in a fury and I was looking for somewhere to park my horse while I sorted things out. Could he help? Glad to, he said, and showed no less enthusiasm when I shortly arrived on a good-looking thoroughbred offering generous cash for its board and lodging. When I asked the trainer the quickest way to London, he said, by taxi to Didcot. I would come to fetch my horse later that day, I told him, and he said not to hurry. He phoned for a taxi for me. We shook hands in tune. Back in London, I phoned Emily. What happened when I left? She laughed. The lads came for evening stables and let us all out. Xenia's tantrums turned to tears. Surtees was purple with fury and phoned the police. And when they arrived, Surtees told them that you'd stolen golden malt. But fortunately, they believed me when I said the horse was Ivan's and you had absolute authority to look after it in any way you thought best. Surtees practically went berserk. Eventually, they persuaded him to push off. He's a fool. He's a dangerous fool. Emily said. You made him look stupid, and he'll never forgive you. Oh, I've no doubt you're right. Now, about Golden Malt. Yes, where is he? Safe enough, but it'll be better if I move him again. Whom do you suggest we send him to? I know exactly the man, she said. He came to me while I was waiting to be let out of that box. He's called Jimmy Jennings. His yard's about 20 miles from here. He and I are good friends. The real advantage of going to him is that he has two yards, and one of them is now standing empty. Would the horse be able to race from there in your name as its trainer? Well, Jimmy's a licensed trainer himself, no problem there. I could inform the jockey club in advance, and as Ivan's a member, I can't see there being any difficulty. Give me ten minutes. I'll fix it and phone you back. Ten minutes later, the phone rang. It's all fixed, Emily said. I told Jimmy the whole situation, he's 100% trustable if you trust him first. He says he'll put golden malt in his empty yard, and the horse will be cared for and exercised by his 16-year-old daughter, who knows when to keep quiet. There's no need for his regular lads even to know golden malt is there. I said you'd get there sometime this afternoon. She gave me directions to a Hampshire village, and said I should look for a square white house with bronze flaming torch gateposts. It was only now that I told Ivan and my mother about the shenanigans in Emily's yard and my travels with Golden Malt. You've gone to a lot of trouble, Ivan said. Well, the horse is yours. You asked me to look after your affairs. So, um, well, I try. Via the classified advertisements in Horse and Hound and the road map and the telephone, I arranged to meet a four-horse travelling horse box in the trainer's yard in East Ilsley. I drove to the rendezvous in Ivan's car, and we loaded Golden Malt for the last leg of his journey. I led the horse box southwards and eastwards along secondary roads until we arrived at Jennings Village near Basingstoke. There, in the main street, stood a square white house with bronze flaming torches on the gateposts. A thin, smiling, middle-aged man opened the door in welcome. His skin had the grey tautness of terminal illness, but his handshake was strong. A pace or two behind him stood a short, fine-boned girl, whom he introduced as his daughter, saying she would drive through the village in the horse box and settle Golden Malt into his new home. He invited me into his house, telling me that Emily had said she was sending her special lad to ensure the safe transit of a special horse. He asked why I was smiling. Was I not Emily's special lad? Well, I'm married to her, I said. Are you that painter fellow who ran off and left her? I'm afraid so. Good Lord! Here, come this way, come this way. He hurried down a hallway, beckoning me to follow, and led me into his office. On the wall hung a painting I'd done and sold four or more years earlier. 
It was of a jockey plodding back to the stands after a fall, disappointment in his shoulders, a tear in his grass-stained breeches. Fella I trained for couldn't pay his bill, Jimmy Jennings explained. He offered me that picture instead. He swore it'd be worth a fortune one day, but I took it because I liked it. It just about sums up a jump jockey's life. Endurance, courage, persistence. I'm glad you like it. Eh, that picture keeps me going, he said. I drove back to London. After supper, Ivan told me what was in the codicil to his will. It came as a pleasant surprise. So pleasant that I hugged him for the first time ever. I hugged my mother too. Then I set off for Scotland. Jed was waiting at Dalhwini in the dawn. Himself wanted me to go directly from train to castle. On the way, Jed told me that I now had a new bed and a new armchair in the bothy, chosen by Jed, paid for by himself. But he doesn't have to, I protested. He told me you wouldn't think so. I explained that you'd cleared out the bothy, and he had me get that pile of muck removed. I hope to God the hilt wasn't hidden in it. Your prayers are answered, I said. Where's the painting, by the way? In my house, with all the other things you gave me. I sighed with relief. As before, I found himself in his dining room eating toast. He raised his big head at my entrance and gave me his formal greeting. Alexander! My lord. Breakfast? Thank you. There were three places laid that morning, one used. James, I learned, had already gone out on the moors. He wants a round of golf, himself said. How about this afternoon? He's leaving tomorrow. I've asked Jed to fix you up with transport, and also with a portable telephone of your own. It may not accord with your liking for solitude, but please humour me in this. After breakfast, the two of us made a complete circuit of the whole castle, only to find on our return, outside the entrance door, a small white car. Oh, that bloody woman, himself grunted. Who? That Lang woman. Oh, what's she up to? I was fascinated to see her again. She and her eighty-year-old wrinkles climbed out of the car and stood waiting. She has joined the conservationists who look after the castle, himself said. <laughs> joined them, she rules them. This past week she somehow got herself appointed chief custodian of the castle's historic contents. And you can guess what she's chiefly after. Oh, the hilt. The hilt. Good morning, Dr. Lang. Lord Kinloch? She shook his hand. Lord Kinloch, I've come to discuss the Treasures of Scotland exhibition being planned for the Edinburgh Festival next year. Himself showed her into the drawing room. He offered sherry. Dr. Lang accepted. Al? He inquired. Uh, not right now. Himself took a polite tokenful. The Flying Eagle, he said cheerfully, will look magnificent in your exhibition, Dr. Lang. The Flying Eagle stood in the castle's main entrance hall, a splendid treble life-sized marble sculpture. Himself had been heard to remark that the conservationists still had the eagle only because its weight made stealing it difficult. We must insist, Dr. Lang said crisply, on taking charge of the Kinloch hilt. My uncle made a non-committal. You can't hide it away forever. Thieves grow more ingenious every year. The hilt belongs to Scotland, was her reply. I could see that it was hardening into a relentless battle of wills, a mortal duel fought over dry La Inia sherry. I said to Zoe Lang, Do you mind if I draw you? Draw me? Well, just a pencil sketch. Whatever for? He's an artist, himself explained. He painted that large picture over there, he pointed. Al, if you want any paper, there's some in my room in the desk drawers. I returned to the drawing room to find my uncle and his enemy standing side by side in front of the gloomiest painting I'd ever attempted. Glen Coe, Dr. Lang said with certainty. The sun never shines. 
The dark grey morning when the Campbells murdered their hosts, the Macdonalds, seemed to brood forever over the heather-clad hills. A place of shivers, of horror, of betrayal. I'd felt ill all the time I was painting it. Zoe Lang stepped closer to the picture for a long inspection, then turned my way. Where do you want me to sit? Uh, by the window, if you would. I got her to sit where the light fell on her face at the same angle as in my painting of her, and I drew the face in pencil, as it appeared now to my eyes, an old face with folds and lines in the skin and taut sinews in the neck. Predictably, she didn't like it. You're cruel, she said. I shook my head. It's time that's cruel. Tear it up. But I didn't. James beat me at golf, and if I was careful replacing my clubs after each shot, sliding them gently into the bag instead of ramming them home, it was because the handles rested not on the firm base of the bag, but in the wide bowl of the grey cloth-wrapped shape within it, the jewelled gold treasure fashioned by Maxim in 1867. Afterwards, in the clubhouse, I wiped clean my woods and irons and stowed them upright in the bag in my locker, sentinels guarding King Alfred's gold cup. I'd had to buy a bag that could be taken apart at the bottom for cleaning, and in the castle's drying room, I had lodged the cup inside. It fitted snugly. By mid-morning the next day, my life in the Bothy had taken shape again. A jeep stood outside my front door. The portable phone was working. My bagpipes were back from Inverness. And Zoe Lang's portrait stood on the easel. I set out the paints I needed, feeling their texture on knife and brush, darkening the background again, adding the shadows that had flashed into my imagination in my travels, putting a glow on the skin and lifelights in the water-like surfaces of the eyes. The woman lived on the canvas as vital as I knew how to make her. At five o'clock, when the quality of the light subtly changed, I put down the brushes. Then I lit my lamp and put it by the window, took my bagpipes out of their case, and walked with them up the rocky hillside. I filled the bag with air and tuned the drones, waiting for such skill as I had to reawaken in my ear, and at length began to feel and to remember the fingering of one of the long ancient laments of a time earlier than Prince Charles Edward. Scottish piping laments could go on for hours, but earthly hunger put a stop to them, usually in my case, and in due time I returned to the bothy filled with a pleasant melancholy and cooked paella. The next morning at dawn I sat in front of the easel, watching the slow change of light on that face, the growth as it almost seemed of the emerging personality taking place before me. It was one thing to imagine, another to do. And if I didn't do, I would know forever that I'd failed in courage, even though, as it now stood, the portrait of an unknown woman was complete and workmanlike. I had ransacked my mother's kitchen for a sharp-pointed knife, and in the end I had borrowed from her not a knife, but a meat thermometer. This unlikely tool had proved to have a spike whose tip was both sharp and abrasive. The spike was for sticking into joints of meat, the round dial from which it protruded measured the inner heat and the state of the cooking. Rare, medium, well done. Of course you can borrow it, my mother had said. But whatever for? Oh, it's scratchy. It's rigid. The dial gives it a good grip. Oh, it's pretty well perfect. So I had the tool. I had the light. I had the vision. I sat and quaked. I had the pencil drawing of the real Zoe Lang. I'd drawn her at the same angle. It should have been easy. I had to see the old face over the young. I had to see it clearly, unmistakably, down to the soul. I had to depict the persistence of the spirit inside the transient flesh. When I finally picked up the meat thermometer, and stood in front of Zoe Lang and made the first scratch down to the pain's grey. It was as if I had surrendered to an inner force. I swept the sharp point across my careful painting, 
I drew the old Zoe in grey scratches, as if the flesh colours weren't anything but background. I scratched the prison bars with the cruelty she'd sensed in me, with the inability to soften or compromise the brutal conception. It was a cold day, and I sweated. By five o'clock, the shape of Zoe Lang's old face was clearly established over the inner spirit. I stretched, flexed my cramped fingers, and went for a walk. I slept only in snatches that night, and dreamed a lot, and in the morning again watched the light grow on Zoe Lang, and spent the day with rigidly governed finger muscles until my arms and neck ached with tension. But by late afternoon I had gone to the limit of what I could understand and show. Only the eyes of the finished portrait looked blazingly young. Whichever other aspect one chose to see, the unchanging spirit of Zoe Lang looked out, present and past, identical. Another restless night. I got up at about four in the morning and took my bagpipes up into the mountains, seeing my way by starlight. On my canvas, the essence of Zoe Lang had triumphed. I played marches and strathspeys for her as a salutation, no longer the sad regrets of the Pibroch. The grey dawn turned to a brilliant blue, sparkling day. I played the pipes and marched to the beat with uncomplicated joy. Too good to last, I suppose. A helicopter rose fast over the ridge of a mountain at my back and flew overhead. It made a circuit and approached the bothy from in front, hovering over the small plateau and finally settling onto the ground. The noise of the engine faded. I watched, in apprehension, if the four robbers had come back. If the four robbers had come, they wouldn't catch me, but they could destroy my painting. The rotor blades came to rest. The side door opened and one man jumped out. One, not four. Blowing a scant lungful of air into the bagpipes, I squeezed and played four or five random notes on the chanter. Jed whirled and looked up. I waved, he spotted me, and beckoned. Where the hell have you been? He demanded as soon as I was within earshot. We've been trying to phone you for hours. What's happened? It's Sir uh, Ivan. His had another heart attack. Oh no, how bad? He... Your mother phoned himself before six this morning. I'd better phone her at once. Himself told me to find you by helicopter and fly you direct to Edinburgh to catch the first flight south. My mother wept. When she could talk, she told me that at bedtime the previous evening she'd heard Ivan cry out and she'd found him lying on the stairs in his pyjamas and dressing gown. He seemed to be out of breath, as if he'd been hurrying. But why should he have been hurrying? It was after ten o'clock. They had given Wilfred the night off. He'd left the box of heart attack remedies at hand on Ivan's bedside table, and my mother had run to fetch them. She'd put one of the tiny nitroglycerin tablets under Ivan's tongue, then telephoned Keith Robiston at his home. She'd put a second pill under Ivan's tongue, and then a third. They hadn't stopped the pain. The ambulance men had given him an injection and oxygen, and had put him on a stretcher. They said they were taking him just along the road to the London clinic. Dr. Robiston had arranged it. He died before they could get him to the operating theatre, said my mother. I squeezed her hand. It wasn't until the next day, Monday, that Patsy swept in. Father will be cremated, she announced, on Thursday at Cockfosters Crematorium at ten o'clock. And of course I've asked everyone to come here afterwards and I've booked a caterer for drinks and a buffet lunch. On and on she went, dealing decisively with every detail of the arrangements, for which I was grateful. I asked a fair number of Ivan's friends and business people to turn up at Park Crescent, even if they couldn't face the crematorium. But in the event, the old boy drew a full house at Cockfosters, an eloquent and moving tribute to a good man. All the brewery people are here, my mother murmured. They had come in a chartered bus. The racing people had come. Several lads from her yard accompanied Emily. Himself came with his countess, Jamie with his pretty wife. 
Chris Young showed up at my shoulder, dressed as the secretary, a leggy, dark-haired presence in black tights, short skirt and baggy black sweater, light-hearted about his new task, guarding my back against Surtees. Himself, delivering a eulogy, quoted to my surprise from the translation of Bede's death song. No one is wiser in thought than he needs to be in considering before his departure what will be adjudged to his soul of good or evil after his death day, he said, and declared that Ivan Westering had behaved on earth with such uprightness that only good would be adjudged to him now after his death day. Afterwards, the grand drawing room at Park Crescent was packed. Tobias Tolwright came, and also Margaret Morden. I asked them both to linger for a while after the crush had cleared. I had no need to ask Oliver Grantchester to stay on for a conference. He showed every sign of wanting to conduct it. Emily's lads, Et, made awkward but genuine little speeches to my mother and left Emily behind when they departed. Emily eyed Chris with obvious speculation, no doubt wondering if this was a serious girlfriend, in view of the glue that kept her ever present at my side. Chris wore white frilled shirt cuffs and a white frill round his neck. He carried a small black handbag. Tobias attempted to chat him up. This is a funeral, for God's sake, I told them. There was a woman standing apart in a far corner of the room, looking a little lost, so I drifted that way. You have no champagne, I said. She wore a tweed skirt, a shiny pale blue blouse, a brown cardigan, flat shoes and pearls. Sixty or thereabouts. Here, take mine. I haven't drunk any. I'll get some more. She took the glass and sipped, eyeing me over the rim. I'm Lady Westering's son, I said. Yes, I know. I I've seen you coming and going. I'm Mrs. Hall. Connie Hall. I live next door. I'm the caretaker there, you see. I've just popped in to pay my respects to Sir Ivan. Always so kind to me, both of them. Really nice people. Yes. Uh, did he find what he was looking for? Looking for? Ever so distressed he was, poor man. Uh, when was that? Why, the night he died. Tell me about it. Well, I was walking by a little dog, same as I always do before going to bed. Uh, yes, of course. And when I got back to the house, there was Sir Ivan down in the road in his pyjamas and dressing gown, poor man, and frantic. What was he frantic about? He was scrabbling among the rubbish bags. He said, Oh, Mrs. Hall, when do they collect the rubbish? I mean, it was after ten o'clock at night. I told him they collected the bags every Monday, Wednesday and Friday morning. He was tearing open some of the bags and looking inside them. He was ever so upset. Did he tell you what he was looking for? He said he was looking for an empty tissue box. He said Lois must have thrown it away. Dear God, I thought, what had been written on it? I said, have you told my mother about this? No, no, I, I didn't want to upset her. Sir Ivan said he'd look in the kitchen, and I said good night to him and went in myself with my little dog. And it was a terrible shock next day when I heard he died. Well, thank you for telling me, Mrs. Hall. Would you like some smoked salmon? Later on, I saw her talking to Patsy, and from her gestures, I suspected she was telling her the same story. I felt a deep thrust of unease, but wasn't quite sure why. The room gradually cleared until only those close to Ivan and his affairs were left. There was to be no formal reading of his will, as its general provisions were well known. The brewery to Patsy, everything else to my mother for her lifetime, reverting to Patsy on her death. For all her fears, Ivan had never swerved from his promises to his daughter. Oliver Grantchester cleared his throat noisily and said, I say, <clears throat> I say, a few times, until everyone was listening. I suggest we all sit down and discuss the immediate future. I looked round at my mother, with me on one side of her and Emily on the other, then Patsy, Surtees and young Xenia, then Margaret Morden and Tobe, himself alone having sent his countess off with James and his wife, Desmond Finch, and finally Chris beside me. Oliver stared at him, 
Uh, you may leave now, he said. I started to say, I want him to stay, and almost choked on the him, turning it to her at the last fraction of credibility. I asked Christina to stay, I repeated. She is my guest in my mother's house. No one protested further. Tobe put his face in his hands. His body shook. Oliver said, We all know that the power of attorney that Ivan gave to Alexander expired with his death. Alexander has no authority from now on to conduct any business for Ivan's estate. Patsy, indeed, forbids it. I said mildly, There's the codicil. Oliver interrupted. Ivan may have written a codicil, but it can't be found. We can assume he tore it up. He didn't tear it up. He gave it to me for safekeeping, and I've brought it here today. Well, g give it to me then, and I'll read it out, Grantchester said. I think, I said politely, that I'll give it to Tobias to read out, if you don't mind, Tobe. Chris opened his handbag and took out the codicil in its envelope. I took the envelope and crossed to Tobias, saying, Ivan signed and dated this twice across the stick-down flap. You can verify that I haven't tampered with it. Tobias examined the envelope, reported on its secure state, and ripped it open, pulling out the single sheet of paper inside. He read the introduction. Then, I bequeath my racehorses to Emily Jane Kinloch, known as Emily Jane Cox. I bequeath the chalice, known as King Alfred's Gold Cup, to my friend Robert, Earl of Kinloch. I appoint Alexander Kinloch, my stepson, to be my executor, in conjunction with the two executors already appointed in my will, namely Oliver Grantchester and Robert, Earl of Kinloch. Patsy said, What does that mean, appointing Alexander as executor? It means, himself told her, that Alexander has a duty to help bring your father's estate to probate. Are you telling me he still has a say in the brewery's affairs? Yes. Oliver, say he's wrong. Well, if the codicil was properly drawn and witnessed, then Lord Kinloch is correct. Tobias stood and walked round the room, showing the paper to everyone in turn. It is written in Sir Ivan's own handwriting, he said. Oliver Grantchester moved smoothly back to his intended overview, accepting the codicil's provisions as fact, whatever he privately thought of them. He droned on, a committee man to his fingertips. The executors would be doing this, and the executors would be doing that, and as my uncle made no protest or suggestion, nor did I. It was Tobias who finally broke up the session by parking a chewed toothpick and apologising to my mother that he had a plane to catch. He was off to Paris for the weekend. I'll be back on Monday, he said to me, in the office on Tuesday if you have any brilliant ideas. When he'd gone, Chris discreetly asked me what I wanted him to do. Follow Surtees, I said promptly. Chris looked down at his clothes. Well, he knows what I look like. Go up two floors, I said. Turn right, you'll find my room. Take what you need. He nodded and quietly left the room. And only Emily, appearing at my elbow, seemed to notice. Are you bedding, Christina? She asked blandly. Indeed not, nor do I intend to. She never takes her eyes off you. I smiled complacently. How's Golden Malt? I murmured. Fine. I've driven over twice. I think the change of scene is doing him good. He was really on his toes two days ago. People gradually left. Himself told me he would be in residence in his London home for the following ten days, asserted his intention of going to Cheltenham races, and kissed my mother affectionately. Emily waved goodbye. Fussy Desmond Finch twittered away. Margaret Morden paid her respects. Oliver Grantchester ponderously closed his briefcase and left. Chris Young ran lightly down the stairs, crossed past the open door of the drawing room, and left quickly by the front door. Who was that? asked my mother. Uh, one of the caterers, I speculated. At that moment, Patsy collected her family, the last to go, and said goodbye. My mother went to the door to see them off. I went up to my mother's sitting room, where she soon joined me, followed by Edna with the tea. When Edna had gone, I told my mother about Ivan and the rubbish bags. I imagine he'd written something important on a tissue box, and somehow it was thrown out. She drank the tea and said slowly, I wrote it. You? Yes, 
but I don't remember what it was. What happened exactly? Or well, someone telephoned. It was in the morning of the day he died. A woman. She wanted to speak to Ivan, and he was in the bathroom, and I said he'd phone her back. And you know how there was never a notepad beside the phone? So I wrote what she said on the back of the box, like Ivan does. And I told him, but... She stopped, trying to remember, and shook her head. I... I didn't think it was important. It probably wasn't, I said. Ivan phoned her back later on, but she was out, I think, or there was no reply. All I wrote on the box was the woman's phone number. And you don't know who she was? She frowned. I remember one thing. She said it was to do with Leicestershire. She didn't give her name? No. Could it have been Norman Corn's sister? Oh, that poor woman. I needed her name. I rang Inspector Reynolds, off duty. All the mortuary could provide was the name of the undertakers to whom they'd released Quorn's body. I rang them and asked who had paid the bills. Sir Ivan Westering, I was told, had written them a cheque to cover all expenses. I'll like him, I thought. I reached Inspector Reynolds in the morning. Norman Quorn's sister, he told me, was a Mrs. Audrey Newton, widow of 4 Minton Terrace, Bloxham, Oxfordshire. He gave me her number. I rang her. She agreed that, yes, she had tried to talk to Sir Ivan Westering, but he hadn't called back. Ever so nice he'd been paying for Norman's cremation. She'd decided to give him something Norman had left with her. A what thing? A paper. A list, really, very short. But Norman thought it important. I told her of Ivan's death. She seemed genuinely sorry. I asked if she would give the list to me. I'll give it to Lady Westering. Ever so kind she was that day I had to identify Norman. I drove my mother northwest out of London in Ivan's car and came to Bloxham, a large village not far from Banbury. At number four Minton Terrace, the front door was opened by the rounded woman we'd met at the mortuary. She invited us in. She was nervous. She'd set out sherry glasses and a plate of small cakes. It took a great deal of sherry and cake to bring her not just to give the list to my mother, but to explain how and why Norman had given it to her. I was over in Wantage. I'd been staying with him for a few days. He was going away on holiday that day, and I was going home. She paused. We nodded encouragingly. He was going to go in a taxi to Didcot Railway Station, but someone... I think from the brewery, came to collect him first. We happened to be standing by the window on the upstairs landing when the car drew up at the gate. She frowned. Norman wasn't pleased. It's extraordinary, but looking back, I might almost say he was frightened. He said he'd better go, she went on. But all of a sudden he took an envelope out of the inner pocket of his jacket and told me to keep it for him until he sent for it. And, of course, he never sent for it. She crossed to a sideboard and took an envelope out of a drawer. End of Side 3 Side 4 I do hope I'm doing right said Mrs. Newton, handing the envelope to my mother. The brewery man telephoned only about an hour ago, asking if Norman had left anything with me, and I said only a short list, but he said he would send someone over for it early this afternoon. I looked at my watch. It was then 12 o'clock, noon. I asked my mother, did you tell anyone we were coming here? Only Lois, she said. She was puzzled by the question. I said we were going to see a lady in Bloxham and wouldn't be needing lunch. I turned to Mrs. Newton. Who was it at the who phoned you today? Desmond Finch, she replied. I took the envelope from my mother and removed the paper from inside. The list was in two sections, 
one of six lines, each line a series of numbers. The other section, also of six lines, each line either a personal or corporate name. I returned the list to the envelope, which I put in my pocket. After some very rapid thinking, I said to Audrey Newton, I think it would be a marvellous idea if you were to go away for a long weekend at the seaside. I said to my mother, and you must go with Mrs. Newton. My mother looked astonished. I said, I wouldn't ask this if it were not very important. To Audrey Newton, I said, I'll pay for you to go to a super hotel if you would go upstairs now and pack what you need for a few days. But, but it's so sudden. Spur of the moment treats are often the best, don't you think? She responded almost girlishly and with an air of growing excitement went upstairs. My mother said, what on earth is this all about? Keeping you safe, I said flatly. Just do it, Ma. I picked up my mobile phone, pressed the numbers of the pager Chris carried, and spoke the message, this is Al, phone me at once. We waited barely 30 seconds before my mobile buzzed. It's Chris. Where are you? Outside Surtees' house. Is he home? Yes. Good. Can Young and Utley do a chauffeur and nice car job? No problem. When and where? Emily Cox's yard in Lambourne. Urgent? Ultra urgent. I'm on my way. I needed something I could draw on. My mother found a letter in her handbag. I opened it out flat, and on its clean inside, with my mother's ballpoint pen, I had time to make nine small drawings before Audrey Newton came downstairs carrying a suitcase. I showed her the page of small heads. The person who came to pick up your brother on the first day of his holiday was at one of these. She looked carefully and pointed firmly. That one. You're sure? Positive. Let's get going, I said. Emily adamantly refused to join my mother and Mrs. Newton in any flight from Egypt. She was not, she pointed out, Moses. I persuaded her to go as far as her drawing room and there explained the dangers of the present situation. You're exaggerating, she objected. Em, I said, I'm afraid if any of you were taken hostage that I might have to do what I don't want to do so I want you safely out of sight. After a long pause, she said, What about my horses? Your head lad, you can phone him. Where from? I don't know, yet. Emily went quickly out of the room and left me looking at the painting I'd given her. I took the corn envelope from my pocket. I lifted the golf picture off its hook and turned it over and I slotted the envelope between the canvas and the frame in the lower left-hand corner so that it was held there securely, out of sight. As I hung the picture back on its hook, a large car rolled up the drive and stopped outside the window. The chauffeur, in a dark navy blue suit and flat cap, climbed out. I went out to talk to him. Where am I going? Somewhere like Tor Bay, find a good hotel with a sea view. Make them happy. Then, my mother, my wife, and the sister of the man who stole the brewery's money, hide them. Chris Young grinned. I'll phone you when they're hidden, he said. When I went back into the kitchen, Emily was talking to the head lad on the telephone. I'll be away this weekend. No, I'll phone you. She gave her instructions about the horses. Severance runs at Fontwell tomorrow. I'll talk to the owners and don't forget to send the colours. She finished the details and hung up. Right, ladies, she said. Let's go. I drove back to London in Ivan's car and booked into a small hotel. I ate a hamburger for dinner and spoke to Chris on the portable phone while sitting beside the fountains in Trafalgar Square. I'm back home, he said. 
My passengers have nice sea view rooms in a hotel in Paynton in Devon. Which hotel? The Redcliffe. They seem quite happy. So, what do you want done next? You can charge me double time if you watch Surtees all weekend. Right, you're on. In the morning, I phoned Margaret Morton. It's Saturday, she objected. It had better be worth it. How about some numbers and names that Norman Corn gave to his sister? Are you talking about routes and destinations? I think so. We need to talk to Tobias, she said. He's gone to Paris and won't be back in his office until Tuesday. On Monday morning, Margaret said, I will liaise with Tobias's office for an appointment and I will rope in the big bank cheese. Say, 10 o'clock Tuesday at the bank? Bring the numbers. Early in the afternoon, himself decided to give me a buzz. Patsy phoned me, my uncle said. She wanted to know if I knew where you were. What did you say? I said you could be anywhere. She sounded quite different, Al. She sounded as if she'd suddenly woken up. I told her that you had been working for her all along at the brewery, and that she'd been grossly unfair to you. What did she say? She said she wanted to talk to you. Do you have her number? He read it out to me. I can't believe this, I said. Oh, give her a chance. It can't do any harm just to talk to her. Ten minutes later, I was doing just that. She apologized. She said that my uncle had given her a proper ticking off and she was willing, if I were, to try and sort things out between us. A truce? I agreed to a truce. Would I come by for a drink? Do you really mean it? I asked. Oh, Alexander, I just want to start to put things right. I told her I would turn up at her stud farm at about 6.30 and then, disconnecting, I phoned Chris's pager. He called back. I said, Are you outside Surtees' house? You betcha. Well, I've been invited there for a drink. Oh, belladonna, aconite, gin and toadstools? I'll take you with me. Uh, have you got the secretary handy? Yes, in the car. So, in the late afternoon, I arrived in Patsy's village at dusk and came across a black-legged figure thumbing a lift. I stopped beside him, and he oozed into the car, wafting billows of expensive scent and doubling up with chuckles. Is anything happening? I said. Half an hour ago, Sir Tease and his missus came out of the house, got into the car, and drove down the road. I followed. They turned into the gates of a house about half a mile from here. I walked from the road to Patsy's front door, with Chris a step behind me, and rang the bell. A young woman opened it. Mrs. Benchmark is expecting you, when I introduced myself. But when she was talking to you earlier, she forgot that she and Mr. Benchmark were going to a drinks party. You're to join her there. It's through the village, past the pub, along on the right-hand side, and you can't miss it. It's all decorated with lights. Chris and I drove along past the pub and came to the house with the lights. When we reached the driveway, which was full of cars, we parked in the road. As we climbed out, Chris stumbled and broke the heel off one of his high-heeled patents. He swore, stopped, and said he'd break off the other one to level himself up. I laughed and set off towards the house a few steps ahead of him. One moment I was walking unsuspectingly along, and the next I was enmeshed in nets and ropes and being dragged through a rustic gate into a garden. No party that I had been to before had started with one of the guests being tied to the trunk of a maple tree next to a bunch of red light bulbs that shone upwards into autumn red leaves, creating a scarlet canopy above my head. At no party that I'd attended before had there been four familiar thugs as guests, one of them busy putting on red leather boxing gloves. I looked round the garden. There was a lawn ringed with bushes. There was a pond with a stream running down into it. 
There was a brightly lit conservatory. The only other guests were Patsy and Surtees and Oliver Granchester. Oliver Granchester. Audrey Newton had firmly pointed to Oliver Granchester's sketched head as the person who'd collected her brother on the day he left Wantage to go on holiday. The one crucial piece of information I hadn't learned was that he had a place in the country half a mile along the road from Patsy's house. Granchester gave a signal to the wearer of the boxing gloves, who hit me low down in the abdomen, which hurt. Granchester said, Where is the King Alfred Gold Cup? A bash in the ribs. Where the hell, I wondered, was my bodyguard? Surtees strode to Granchester's side. Where's the horse? I didn't tell him. Painful decision. Hit him harder! I thought, detachedly, that I would quite likely prefer to die than give in to Surtees. Oliver Granchester stepped forward. Where's the list? The list? The point of all the battering, I supposed, was to make it more likely that I would answer the one question that really mattered. Where's the list? The gloves thudded here and there. Face, ribs, belly, head. Where's the list? Such a pretty garden, I groggily thought. The punch bag practice stopped. Granchester went away. Patsy's face swam into my close vision. What list? she said. It made no sense. Surely she knew what list. She looked worried, horrified even. But she'd lured me there. Alexander, Patsy said in distress. Whatever Oliver wants, for God's sake, give it to him. This, uh, this, she gestured to my trust state and to the thugs. This is awful. I agreed with her, but I couldn't believe she didn't know what her friendly neighborhood lawyer wanted. Oliver Granchester returned from the direction of his house, pulling behind him a barbecue cooker on wheels. Oh God, I thought. Oh no. He took the grill grid off the barbecue and propped it against one of the legs. Then he went back into his conservatory and returned carrying a bag of charcoal briquettes and a bottle of lighter fuel. He poured briquettes from the bag into the firebox of the barbecue and then poured the whole bottle full of lighter fuel over the briquettes. He struck a match and tossed it onto the fuel. Flame rushed upward in a roaring plume, scarlet and gold. He picked up the grill with a pair of long tongs and settled it in place to get hot. I could see the thugs' faces. They showed no surprise. One showed sickened revulsion, but still no surprise. I thought, they've seen this before. Norman Corn burned in a garden with grass cuttings in his clothes. I would tell him, I thought. Enough was enough. My entire body already hurt abominably. There was a point beyond which it wasn't sensible to go. They weren't my millions. They were Patsy's millions. God damn her soul. Granchester waited while the heat built up. Then, when the briquettes glowed a bright, searing red, he lifted the barred grill off the fire with his tongs and dropped it flat on the lawn where it sizzled and singed the grass. You'll lie on that if you don't tell me, he said. Where's the list? I meant to tell him. But when it came to the point, I couldn't. So I burned. I could hear someone screaming. It was Patsy. No! No, you can't. For God's sake, stop it. Oliver, Surtees, you can't do this. Stop it. For God's sake, stop it. Then the scene blew apart. With a crash, 
the driving cab of a large coach smashed through the fence between the drive and the garden. Out of the bus and onto the lawn poured a half-drunk mob of football supporters, all dressed in orange, it seemed, with orange scarves and heavy boots and raucous shouting voices. Where's the beer then? Where's the beer? Through the demolished fence came more and more orange scarves. Where's the beer? The four thugs who'd been pinning down my arms and legs decided to quit so that I was able to roll off the grill and lie face down on the cool grass. And a pair of long legs in black tights appeared in my limited field of vision with a familiar voice above me saying, Jesus Christ, Al! And I tried to say, What took you so long? Chris poured cold water over me. He squatted down beside me and said, Al, are you okay? A goldfish flapped on the grass. Poor little bugger. A goldfish out of the pond. Pond water that Chris had used. Great idea. I made an attempt to crawl, and Chris, seeing the point, hooked an arm under my armpit. Somehow or other, I crossed the grass and lay down in the cold pond, a stone for a pillow, water lilies on my chest. Relief enormous. Did bloody Surtees do this? Chris demanded. Bloody Grantchester, I said. Chris went away. There were more people in the garden. Policemen. I lay in the pond and watched the orange scarves scurry about looking for free beer, and I watched the police slapping handcuffs on anything that moved, including the four thugs. I heard the law trying to identify the driver of the bus, and I watched Patsy's bewilderment. Chris came back. I caught bloody Grant yesterday trying to sludge. You'll be going nowhere for a while. Chris, get lost. Do you mean it? The police are looking for the young woman who drove the bus. Some minutes later, I heard a voice say, Get out of the pond. The voice held police authority. I opened my eyes. He was a middle-aged man in a tweed jacket. Just behind him stood Patsy. Stand up. I don't know if he can, Patsy said. They were hitting him. Who were? She looked over to where handcuffed figures sat gloomily on the grass. And they burnt him, Patsy said. I couldn't stop them. The policeman said, Mrs. Benchmark, do you know this man? Of course I know him. She stared down at me. He's... he's my brother. It came nearer to breaking me up than all Grantchester's attentions. She saw that it did, and it made her cry. She brushed the tears away and told the policeman she would point out my attackers. When they moved off, their place was taken by Surtees, who was very far from a change of heart. His feet quivered. I thought he might kick my head. Surtees, I said, any more shit from you, and I'll tell Patsy where you go on Wednesday afternoons, and I'll tell her what sort of sex you go there for. He backed away as if I'd touched him with the plague. I gazed up at the bright colored lights in the trees. Life had its sweet moments, after all. No one had actually seen Oliver Grantchester being attacked and tied up in his own garage. Not even Oliver himself. When he recovered consciousness, he was found to be suffering not only from a blow to the back of the skull, but also from a broken nose, a broken jaw, and extensive damage to his lower abdomen and genitals. Who ever would do such a thing? Patsy organized me into a private hospital that specialized in burns. An elderly woman doctor wrapped me in biosynthetic burn-healing artificial skin and large bandages. And a couple of cracked ribs, too, she speculated. Wouldn't you say? I would. She smiled. I'll see that you sleep. 
She drugged me out until six in the morning when I phoned Chris's bleeper and got his return call five minutes later. Where the hell are you? he demanded. I told him, bring me some clothes. He arrived to find me standing by the window watching the dawn break. I didn't expect you to be on your feet. More comfortable, I said succinctly. That bus, if I may say so, was brilliant. He grinned. Oh, go on then, I said. Tell all. He came over to join me by the window. Well, those thugs that jumped you, they were the real McCoy. I couldn't handle four of them, so I followed the wooden fence that's all around that garden until I found a place where I could see through, and there they were, your four thugs bashing you about. And there were three other people there, too, which made seven. <laughs> I couldn't manage seven. No. So I ran down the road to the pub and used their telephone and told the police there was a riot going on, and they wanted to know where exactly. So I told them. And then this bloody big coachload of fervent psychos invaded the bar. And I thought, whoa, manna from heaven. I went outside where half of them were still in the bus, and I yelled at them, that there was free beer down the road at a party. And I just got into the driver's seat and drove that damn jumbo straight through Grantchester's fence into the garden. And what exactly did you do to Oliver Grantchester? Oh, I uh, kicked him a good many times in the ghoulies. Around mid-morning, I had a visit from a Detective Inspector Vernon whom I'd met, it transpired, in the garden. Mrs. Benchmark says that Mr. Grantchester was instructing four other men to ill-treat you. You could put it like that, I said. Can you tell me why? You'll have to ask Mr. Grantchester, I said. His jaw's badly broken. This morning he can't speak. He's badly bruised in the abdomen, too. Inspector Vernon asked me if I knew who had attacked Grantchester. I'd been in the pond, I reminded him. I said that the same four thugs had battered me earlier in Scotland, where I'd given a statement to the police. I suggested that he might also talk to Chief Inspector Reynolds of the Leicestershire Police about burns, barbecues, and mown grass. On Monday morning, I discharged myself from the hospital against their advice. A police car came to transport me to Vernon's official stamping ground, where I was invited to look through a window into a brightly lit room and to say if I'd seen any of eight men at any earlier time in my life. No problem. Numbers one, three, seven, and eight. Number three caused the damage you can see in my face. He's left-handed. All four assisted in compelling me to lie on that hot grill. All four also attacked me outside my home in Scotland. I don't know their names, but I do know their faces. I told Inspector Vernon that number seven in the lineup had been wearing what looked like my father's gold watch, stolen from me in Scotland. Also, I said, Number seven didn't relish the burning. That won't excuse him. No, but if you could make it worth his while, he might tell you what happened to a Norman Quorn. The inspector didn't say who. He went quietly away. A uniformed constable brought me a sandwich lunch. After another couple of hours, Inspector Vernon came back into the room. Can you identify your father's gold watch? He asked. It has an engraving on the back. Alistair from Vivienne. Vernon faintly smiled. Number seven in the lineup may be known as Bernie, he said. Bernie, as you saw, is a worried man. He paused. If you hadn't told me to ask Bernie questions about Norman Quorn, I wouldn't have thought of doing it. But Bernie split wide open, and now my superiors are thinking of going to the prosecution department with a charge against Oliver Grantchester for manslaughter. The manslaughter of Norman Corn. Hell's teeth. Bernie said that the four you call the thugs 
all go to a gym in London, east of the city, which Oliver Grantius has been visiting for the past few years. So when he wanted a rough job done, he recruited them. Unfortunately, the job went wrong. Corn died, I said. Werner nodded. Grantius had told them to turn up at his house in the country. He arrived with Norman Corn and he took them into the garden. The four thugs tied him to the same tree as they tied you, but they didn't belt him. Grantchester lit the barbecue and told Corn he would burn him if he didn't come across with some information. Vernon paused, then went on. Grantchester waited until the fire was very hot, and then he threw the grill onto the ground. The four thugs threw Corn onto the grill and held him there. And although he was screaming and hollering that he would tell, Grantchester wouldn't let him up. He seemed to be enjoying it. And when he did let him up, Corn dropped down dead. I'm not surprised, I said. And Grantchester got Bernie and the others to put Corn into the boot of his car in the garage. And he paid them and told them to go away, which they did. After a while, I said, Did you ask Bernie about Scotland? Vernon nodded. Grantchester was behind that, too. He told them they should have made sure you were dead before they threw you down the mountain. Well, well, I said. On Tuesday morning, I went to the bank meeting in Reading. The area manager, Margaret Morden, and Tobias were already sitting round a table. When I went in, they stood up. Uh, don't, I said awkwardly. Uh, am I late? No, Tobe said. I took the one empty chair. I'm sorry about the bruises, I said. I got a bit clobbered again. Very careless. Tobias said, I've talked to Chris. He told me about Grantchester's barbecue. Clearly, Tobias had relayed Chris's account to the bank man and to Margaret. Well, I said, can we find the money? They passed round a piece of paper, the riddle that Quorn had left, which I had retrieved from behind the painting in Lambourne. It soon became apparent that although the numbers and names belonged to bank accounts, Norman Corn had been coy about setting down on paper which account referred to which bank. Thoughtfully, they each copied out the whole list. Each of them fed into their separate computer a disk recording what each of them knew. The bank had supplied a fax machine dedicated to this one job. The room was silent except for the tapping of keys and the drumming of thoughtful fingers when the solutions didn't quickly appear. By lunchtime, they'd got nowhere nearer the end of the rainbow. The trouble is, the bank man explained, that we have here three lots of variables. We have to match the account numbers on the list with a name on the list and with the bank identification number that we already have. And then we have to send that combination to the bank in question and hope to get a response from them to acknowledge that that account exists. We haven't so far been able to do that. By the end of the afternoon, they were all looking cast down. They said they would think of a new strategy for the next day. I drove a shade dispiritedly back to Lambourne and found that Emily, my mother, and Audrey Newton had arrived minutes before me. We've had a lovely weekend, my mother said. Thank you so much. You've bruised your face, dear, did you know? Emily took Audrey and my mother into the house, and Chris inspected me. You look lousy, he said. Worse than Sunday. Oh, thanks. Do you want anything else done? Just take Audrey Newton home to Bloxham. The telephone rang in the kitchen while we were sitting round the table watching Emily search for supper in the freezer. It was himself, for me. Al, where have you been? he asked. I've had Patsy on the line all day. She wants to talk to you. She says you signed yourself out of some hospital she put you in. 
What the hell's happened? Can I come for a drink with you at about six tomorrow evening? Of course. All news then, and please don't tell Patsy where I am. Just ask her if she'll meet me at two o'clock tomorrow in the car park of the bank's head office in Reading. And tell her... I paused. Tell her thanks for the help. As I put the phone down, Emily said, Patsy helped you. I told them that Oliver Grantchester had been trying to lay his hands on the brewery's missing millions. I said, he'd either conspired with Norman Corn to steal the money in the first place, or tried to wrest it from him afterwards. I'm not sure which, and Patsy has finally woken up to the fact that her dear avuncular Oliver had been trying his damnedest to rob her, as she now owns the brewery. I drove my mother to Reading in the morning and saw her onto the London train. At the bank, Tobias, Margaret and the area manager were gloomily studying the electronic messages on the machine they'd left alive to receive them overnight. Useful information from around the globe, zero. The experts had drawn up ways of approaching the problem from so far untried angles, but nothing worked. At two o'clock I met Patsy in the car park, as arranged. She was unsure of herself. Awkward. I'd never seen her like that. Let's go inside, I said. I want the bank people to tell you that I'm not trying to steal from you. In fact, I'm doing my damnedest to recover your inheritance. Alexander, she said. Dear Alexander, I've been such a fool. I'm so sorry, and I don't need to listen to any bank people. She gave me a long look and a nod, and went away. At the end of the afternoon that produced nothing but frustration, I drove back to London and told himself, over a tumbler full of single malt, exactly what had been going on. Then back to my mother's, where we had dinner, and afterwards played Scrabble. My mother won. I took a pill at bedtime and stayed asleep for hours. I was astounded to meet Keith Robiston on the stairs when I dawdled down to breakfast. Uh, come in here, he said, pointing me into Ivan's study. Your mother's worried about you. Why? She says you look awful and she beat you at Scrabble. He studied my face. Well, what have you got to tell me? I told him about the burns. They said there wasn't any sign of infection and that I would heal okay. I took off my shirt and he unwound the bandages. Don't tell my mother, I begged him. It's too soon after Ivan. All right. My back must have looked okay because he said he wouldn't disturb the synthetic skin dressings and rewrapped the damage from armpits to waist. Much pain? Uh, it comes and goes. He gave me enough pills for another four days. I phoned Tobe's office. He'd gone away for the weekend. But it's only Thursday, I protested. Margaret was unavailable. The big bank cheese had left me a message. All the King Alfred Gold Cup race expenses will be honoured by the bank, working closely with Mrs Benchmark, who is now organising everything for the day at Cheltenham. In their different ways, the experts were telling me that the missing millions were irretrievable. Fair enough, I reflected. The brewery can still trade its way back to solvency. In the afternoon, I drove to Lambourne, arriving in the hour of maximum bustle, evening stables. While I was still sitting in Ivan's car, a horse box drove into the yard and unloaded golden malt. I stood up out of the car. Emily came over. Together we watched the horse being led a few times round the yard to loosen his leg muscles after the confines of his journey. He looks great, I said. Emily nodded. That short change of scene suited him. And Saturday? He won't disgrace himself. Cheltenham Racecourse had extended every red carpet courtesy to King Alfred's Brewery 
the chief sponsor of one of their top crowd-pulling early season afternoons. In the sponsor's box, Patsy had organized a private family lunch for my mother. I met my mother at the club entrance and walked with her to the box. Patsy welcomed her with kisses. Behind her stood Surtees, who would not meet my eyes. Hello, Surtees, I said. He gave me a look and took two paces backwards. What a grand change, I thought, from days gone by. Himself and I, Ivan's executors, stood in the parade ring with Emily, watching Golden Malt stride round, led by his lad. Emily's jockey joined us, dressed in Ivan's racing colours of gold, green checks, gold cap. Emily told the jockey to be handy in fourth place all the way, if he could, and make his move only after he'd rounded the last bend and straightened up for the uphill run to the winning post. Wait, even though it hurts. Wait. He'll deliver if you do. He's a great fighter uphill. When the horses had gone out onto the track, himself, Emily and I joined my mother up in the sponsor's box. Patsy arrived with Surtees. Patsy's manner to her husband had changed, I noticed. She was looking at him with the fresh, cold eyes of disillusion. I would give that marriage another year at most. Golden Malt looked splendid, but he faced no easy task. The generous money prize, alongside the prestige of taking home the King Alfred Gold Cup, even if only in replica, had drawn out the best. Of the nine steeplechasers lining up, Golden Malt was generally counted only fourth or fifth in the hierarchy. All nine went round in a bunch. No one fell. The crowd on the grandstand yelled and drowned out the commentator, and Golden Malt came round the last bend in close fourth place and headed for glory up the hill. Emily put down her race glasses. Himself was shouting with powerful lungs. My mother clasped her hands over her heart. Oh, come on, come on, Patsy murmured. Three horses crossed the line together. One couldn't tell by eye which head had nodded forward. We all went down to the unsaddling area, and none of the little group could disguise the agony of the wait for the photograph. When the result came, it was in the impersonal voice of the course announcer. First, number five. Number five, Golden Malt. Afterwards, my mother presented the replica of the King Alfred Gold Cup to Emily, to universal cheers and a blaze of cameras. Ivan would have loved it. Back in London, my mother and I were breakfasting and reading the Sunday newspapers when my Uncle Robert telephoned. Al, whatever you're doing, stop doing it. I've had Jed on the line. The conservationists have invaded the Bothy with spades, pickaxes, and metal detectors, searching for the hilt. Zoe Lang is there with the light of battle in her eyes. We must leave at once. We caught a flight to Edinburgh, where we were met by the helicopter pilot who'd risked the Bothy's plateau once before. Our arrival alarmed the crowd at the Bothy, which scattered outwards. When the rotor stopped, the crowd returned, led by Zoe Lang, clutching a metal detector. Close on her heels came Jed. How dare you, himself thundered at the fanatical lady. This bothy, she proclaimed, was given to the nation with the castle. It certainly was not. It comes under the heading of my private apartment. Behind both of their backs, Jed raised his eyebrows to heaven. The conservationists were making almost as much mess of my home as the four thugs had done. There were holes in the ground everywhere. Beside each hole lay a little heap of empty coke cans and other metal debris. In the ruined section of the bothy that housed the rubbish bins, the corner that held the old bread oven had been excavated to a depth of three feet and the oven left belly up. At the carport end, the earth had more or less been ploughed. 
I left himself arguing with Zoe Lang and went inside. To my surprise and relief, the place looked tidy. The picture, wrapped in its sheet, stood on the easel. It seemed the searchers had left the core of the search until last. Just then, my mobile phone buzzed. I could hear nothing in the receiver but a crackle with the faintest of voices in the background. Whoever you are, shout! An ear full of crackle, and one word, Tobias! Tobias? Crackle. His faint voice said, I've found it! Another load of static. Then his voice said, Are you there? Yes. Where are you? In Bogota. In Colombia. There was a sudden clearing of the static, and I could hear his voice plainly. The money is all here. I found it by accident. The account here had three names on it, not just one or two. A person's name and two corporate names. I put them all on an application form by mistake, and it was like pressing a button. A door opened, and they're asking for my onward directions. The money will be back in Reading next week. I thought you went away for the weekend. He laughed. I went to Panama. We were getting nowhere electronically. I went to bang a fist, and the trail led to Bogota. Uh, Tobe, see you soon, he said. The crackle came back. I switched off the telephone and felt my knees weakening, as in the phrase, weak at the knees, which I'd never believed in before. After a while, I took the sheet off the picture and the force of it filled the small room. I had thought I would need time's perspective to know what I'd done, but the power of the concept seemed to have taken over and made me its instrument. The picture might not comfort, but one wouldn't forget it. I went out to where himself and Zoe Lang were gesticulating in each other's airspace with none too gentlemanly fury. Himself stopped abruptly, alerted by whatever he saw in my face. What is it? he said. The money is found. Himself stared at me, alone with the realization that what had been paid for had been miraculously delivered. Zoe Lang, thinking that I'd found some treasure or other within the Bothy, disappeared inside. Tobias found the money in Bogota. Using the list? Yes. Himself's rejoicing was like my own, unexpressed as a matter of warmth rather than whoops. Zoe Lang came out of the Bothy and walked towards us, still carrying her metal detector. She ignored himself and spoke directly to me. You will tell me the truth. I am sure you are a very good liar, but this time you will tell me the truth. I made no reply. She took it as assent, which it was. I saw that picture. Did you paint it? Yes. Is it you who has hidden the Kinloch hilt? Yes. Is it here, in your body? And would I find it? I said, after a pause, yes and yes. My uncle's mouth opened in protest. Zoe Lang flicked him a glance and thrust the metal detector into his arms. You can keep the hilt, she said to him. I'll look for it no longer. Himself watched in bewilderment while she told one of her helpers to round up the searchers and that they were leaving. The hilt isn't here. Go home. When they'd gone, Zoe Lang said to himself, Don't you understand? No, frankly, I don't. He hasn't seen the picture. I said. Oh, she blinked. 
What is it called? Does it have a name? Portrait of Zoe Lang. A tear appeared in each of her eyes and ran down her wrinkled old cheeks. I will not fight you, she said to me. You have made me immortal. Himself looked long at the picture when Zoe Lang had driven away. Immortal, he said thoughtfully. Time will tell, I said. Mad Alexander, who messes about with paints? I smiled. Uh, one has to be slightly mad to do almost anything, such as hiding a treasure. Yes, he said. Where is it? Well, I said, when you gave me the hilt to hide all those years ago, the first thing I thought about was metal detectors, because those things find gold almost more easily than any other metal. He looked around at all the little dug-up heaps of unprecious metal. <laughs> well, yes, I grinned. Yeah, I buried a lot of things to keep searchers busy. Really, Al? The childish mind, I said. So, where is the hilt buried? Everyone talks about buried treasure. So, I didn't bury it. He stared. I said, the metal that most confuses a detector is a sheet of aluminium foil. So to start with, I wrapped the hilt in several loose layers of foil. Then I took a length of cotton duck, and that's the stuff I paint the pictures on, and I primed it with several coats of gesso to stiffen it and make it waterproof. Then I painted it all over with burnt umber acrylic paint, which is a dark brown color and also waterproof. What then? I wrapped the foil bundle in the cotton duck and super glued it so that it wouldn't come undone. Then, all over the surface, I superglued pieces of granite. I waved a hand at the grey, stony ground of the plateau. And then, I glued it onto the mountain. You did what? I pointed at the metal detector in his hands. Turn it upside down. He did as I said, waving the flat, round plate in the air. Now I'll switch it on, I said, and did so. Now, my lord, follow me. I walked not up onto the hill, as he obviously expected, but into my corrugated, iron-topped carport. The upside-down metal detector whined non-stop. If you go to the rear wall, I said, and stand just there, I pointed, you will hear the honour of the Kinlochs, which is up on the carport roof, where it joins the mountain. If you stand just there, the hilt of Prince Charles Edward Stuart's ceremonial sword will be straight above your head. This audiobook was produced and published by Penguin Books Limited.